these traditions were all about <laughs> revolution. Yeah. Right? They were about like the, 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 the Tibetan Buddhist academy was about generating heroic altruists. <laughs> Right, like this is really, it's, you know, the, the mythology of the fourth turning is really about, it's like the mythology of, of Shambhala, of, of the, the kind of return of the rainbow warriors, so to speak. And the fact that all of this psychotechnology is to help facilitate a revolution of consciousness and creativity and, 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 and love. Wow, this may be my favorite podcast of all time. Now, I've had a lot of great podcasts, but this is definitely up there. Dr. John Churchill has spent the last 30 years deeply, deeply studying Tibetan Buddhism to the place where, although he would never acknowledge it, I really believe he's reached a mystical understanding of this philosophy slash religion that really illuminated how elementary my own understanding of Buddhism was. I may have a Buddha in my house, but my understanding was so elementary as John actually dives in and talks about how this philosophy goes all the way up and all the way down and leads to a potential map for the evolution of our consciousness and the evolution of our society from the lens of mystical Tibetan Buddhism. It's a conversation you just can't miss, and I can't wait to have more of them with him as well. So enjoy this chat with Dr. John Churchill. So we were just speaking right before we clapped ourselves in here about something that I think was very interesting, and it it goes into the deeper conversation that we're going to get to, but it's the interplay between empire and ancient wisdom traditions mm -hmm. and how there's been this kind of perpetual conflict and it's somewhat in the shadow of our psyche. Like yeah. we're not quite aware of the depth at which it's at play. And so if you wanted to kind of retrace a yeah. little of the steps that we were taking, you know, kind of talking yeah. about yeah. about this process. So we were we were talking about how one of the things that an individual needs to do in order to heal, if you go into therapy, is you need to be able to remember what's happened to you. Because if you don't remember what's happened to you, you can't integrate it. Right. And that's true personally, but it's also true culturally. Right. Yeah. So the, our culture, the Western civilization, if you will, which had a, a deeply rich um, initiatory and indigenous tradition, was was slowly wiped out by the forces of empire over a period of a, a few thousand years. Mm -hmm. And we lost access to the, uh, the, the plant wisdom, and we lost access to initiatory processes that were that the Romans shut down, right? They shut down the Dionysian mysteries and the Elysian mysteries, right? They, uh, they infiltrated Christianity, which was an attempt at the time to be a kind of a universalizing, um, center bringing well and also to quell the to quell the conflict and disruption at the time of constantine when he made that declaration mm -hmm. it was a lot of the slave classes you know were right had adopted christianity and were threatening to further disrupt this structure this hierarchical structure right so right. it's like all right what do we do Mm -hmm. We'll go right into it. Right, right. You know, no more right. crucifying them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no more throwing them to the lions. That's not right. working anymore. Right, right, right. And you have to assume that if you thought that it would work, you would have just kept on doing the same thing. Sure. That's like right. it wasn't like this great, you know, spiritual revelation of the the power of the teachings of Yeshua. God no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, was, he was born and bred in an right. empire. That's right. And this was an empire move. Yeah, and and we still and so em empire shut down the access to the feminine, yeah, right? So burnt many of the women at the stake and our indigenous medicine traditions were then lost. Yeah, I mean, if, you th if, if we think about where we would be today, if, those, if our alchemical traditions were kept alive, I mean, you probably know that the majority of Isaac Newton's work was alchemical, mm -hmm. right? So that, like, these great minds of Western civilization, many of them were doing this we're continuing this work hidden in the back room, knowing that they couldn't that they couldn't bring it out into the public. What do you mean by uh, Isaac Newton, you know, having a foundation of alchemical work? So the majority of, of mo most people don't know it. The majority of Isaac Newton's work was on spiritual alchemy, mm -hmm. 
Like that was hidden by his family. The papers were hidden by his family. They weren't released. I think that books only came in out in the last decade on this guy was actually, you know, involved in, in alchemy and spiritual transformation. Mathematics and physics were his way of, of were the outer dimension of that. Right. Right. The, the Western tradition, um, geometry, right? The, the sake, like if you entered Plato's Academy, you had to study geometry. Geometry had its basis as, as metaphor for the sacred. Mm -hmm. Right, so whether it's geom geometry, whether it's mathematics, all of these different dimensions of the academy that had a sacred basis were slowly taken over and and uh, whitewashed, if you will. And also, people were driven into specialization because yes, of right. you know industrial and economic drivers, which is the the, the form in, under which empire has taken hold. I mean, empire has now. It's less about conquering new lands. All lands have been conquered, and That's it's right. well. Although Russia is trying to bring back the old, yeah. the old down and dirty ways, yeah. it seems like right now. But besides that, for the most part, you know, empire and conquest is kind of off the table. Again, not probably because people don't want to. You just can't do that anymore. So they've had to conquer in other ways, buy up all of the resources of a country, mm -hmm. control them e economically, control your own people yeah. economically. So yeah. conquest has just shifted the weapons and the tactics and the strategies to capitalist empire. And it's, and it's controlled, it's defined what's, what's okay in every field, right? Mm -hmm. So in my field, psychology, Right there's a there's a pretty conventional assumption about well what what are the bands of psychology? It's the same thing with with medicine, right? Like well what's you know we have alternative medicine beyond beyond the academy, but we've been we've been we've been really limited as a culture in terms of access to our own mystery traditions, our own our own wisdom traditions. And that's part of what got us in this conversation as well. Is I was talking about time I spent in Epidaurus mm -hmm. in. Greece, which was the kind of the, the healing center of the of antiquity of, of that world at the time. And their process was to treat the psyche first through a variety of different, really actually accessing placebo effect in many mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. They would, if somebody was having some particularly challenging experience, they would oftentimes or some kind of you know illness that they diagnosed they would play deeply like deeply interesting psychological tricks like they would take non-venomous snakes because people believed in the healing power of snake venom mm -hmm. that's kind of where like mm -hmm. you know snake oil salesmen and all of this kind of comes right. in is like they believed in the power of snake venom and snake venom does have certain powers most of it's poisonous however they had this belief at the time and it was a universal belief that was kind of part of the culture so they would have non-venomous snakes actually bite the people and they would tell them that they had a special venom uh -huh. that could heal their ailment. Right. And so they would go through this initiatory experience of a snake biting you, which is fucking terrifying. It was all psychosomatic. All psychosomatic. And that was like <laughs> step one. And then they would bring them to the theater right. where they would go through catharsis, where they yeah. would actually experience the emotional gamut of what they, you know, of processing emotions that they hadn't allowed themselves to feel. Now they didn't have the technology of shamanic breath work and mm -hmm. some of the things that we have to get through into, sure. into catharsis, but they did it through theater. Yeah. And then they would go to hot cold plunge therapy, kind of treating the nervous system mm -hmm. and giving people, and then darkness therapy, giving them rest. These are all the things that we're doing. Right. right. And then <laughs> finally, finally, and we, uh, but when we say we, it's just, Still a small portion yeah, of Yeah, it's a small, but it's still a week. It's still a week. <laughs> it's still a week. And then finally, they would bring out the scalpels or bring out the whatever actual, you know, mm. allopathic medicines yeah. that they had and treatments that they had at the time. But that was always the progression. It was like mm. the psyche first, then the emotional body, right. you know, then the nervous system. And then finally, they would apply the treatments. And of course, empire has flipped that on its head because you get paid yeah. primarily for right. <laughs> for the pharmaceutical or the surgical intervention first. Right. And so now we've actually lost this ancient wisdom and said, oh, all of that was just, 
yeah. you know, bullshit. But then there's other people starting to bring that back, like Dr. you know Joe Dispenza, mm-hmm, starting mm-hmm. to work with the placebo effect. Say, let's not discount this in every clinical trial. Let's actually use this. That's right. How about that? It's the mind healing yeah. the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Magic. That's right. Yeah. So in the in the tradition that I've been trained in, which is a, an Indo-Tibetan Buddhist tradition, right imagination is a vital part of that because your brain doesn't know the difference between what you imagine to be real and what's real, mm. right? I mean, we, we now know that. If you put, if you put us in, in an MRI machine and you hold up a you know, red apple and, and you say, hey, imagine this to be green, even though you're seeing it as red, the brain will show green, right? And so, I mean, we know this works for us and against us. It works against right. us because that's what projection is all, is all about. If I can't see you for who you really are, and I'm projecting something onto you, then uh, then I'm exper- you know, what I'm experiencing isn't isn't reality, right? It's my own imagination. And you're often doing it for some hidden advantage uh-huh. that you have, which is the desire to create distance from right. the other person, right? right? So if you project some villainy mm-hmm. onto your buddy, yeah, you know, or your ex partner or something like that, it allows you the distance, like. Phew, I didn't want to be with them anyways. That's right. That that person, yeah, 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 know, yeah. that yeah. evil person, like, yeah. So yes, it's actually counterproductive. It actually right. prevents healing. But we're doing subtle things for our advantage mm. all the time using this same technology of imagination and yeah. projection. Yeah. So what what they what they and we, we can we can kind of look into these various types of practices. Sure. But if you see these um, Tibetan practices which involve deity, what they call deities which essentially visual forms with, that you're identifying yourself as an, an archetypal form. Mm-hmm. But essentially what they're designed to do is, is like activate the archetypal structure of your own psyche, right? The, if we, we all need a, uh, we all need an ideal, an, an ideal structure around which our psyche can grow. Mm-hmm. And our self image for most of us is usually somewhat based on developmental trauma. So no matter whenever we are using our imaginations and we look at who we are, it tends to be a limited version of who we are, right? So one of the ways that human beings suffer and the the unique thing about the Buddhist tradition is it looks at the spiritual journey a lot through suffering. Like where where does human suffering arise? And one of the places that we suffer is is who we imagine ourselves to be, Mm. right? And what do we imagine the world to be? So there's a whole uh, corpus of practice around optimizing the imagination to begin to create a, a psychological structure that we can grow into. Yeah, I think this is definitely one of the things that we suffer from because, all right, we have a model of Jesus. Mm-hmm. What would Jesus do? We what put it on Jesus our we do? put it on our fucking right. bracelets. Right. Well, what this ends up leading to is a whole host of shame and spiritual bypass. Is that what he would do? <laughs> well said. Well, I mean, well said. I think the issue is, is like, what, so what the, the Buddhist tradition said is, is like, you have got to take that literally, which literally, you, if literally you realize that you were the Christ, yep. and you literally, this is what the Bodhisattva vow is about. So you take on that responsibility. So if you were to literally take that responsibility on as, as, as your path, and then act as if that was true, knowing, of course, and this is the skillful piece that makes the difference between a, you know, a, a, a psychotic <laughs> and, a, and, and a spiritual practitioner, mm-hmm. knowing, of course, is that it's a structure, but it's a structure that, that then demands that you kind of live up to it yep. fully, fully, yep. right? And everything that we do, right? I mean, God, imagine if, if people were really applying that, like what would Jesus do? Well, I think part of the problem is is that we've gotten an, an we've downloaded a very incomplete picture right of what would Jesus do. Yes. There's not a lot of like real understanding. Right. Either it's been, you know, redacted from the records mm. or it's been I mean a lot of what's resurfaced is, you know, ideas about 
some very deep tantric practices between Jesus and Mary. I mm-hmm. don't know if that's fucking true, but it makes a lot of sense to me. Sure. Certainly has facilitated more of the Christ being able to move through me yes. when I've been able to tap into that. Absolutely. So it makes sense that that was part of, but that part's been redacted. So, all right, well, that makes it a little bit more difficult yeah. to try and use that as a model. And also just the day-to-day things. Was he, was he like, fucking with his disciples every once in a while cracking some <laughs> jokes you know like like cutting it up like playing a prank like being a being a normal human right, right. for sure you That's know right. and and so yeah. we can't we can't actually imagine ourselves because he's it, that figure has been so dehumanized from all of the human mm-hmm. fabric and fiber That's right that we're like trying to trying to model ourselves after something that wasn't real Well that's Part of the problem, I think we mentioned this earlier. We we're talking is what are the models? What are the models that we have for like what is a what does a mastery look like? Right, right. Does it look like someone who's worked like completely like left the world and is above it, right? Or is it actually the opposite? Is it some, is it really about like deep embracing of the world and being as fully engaged in the world as we possibly can be, and that that these spiritual practices help facilitate us doing that, right? Mm-hmm. Facilitate us being able to to see one another and connect with one another. Um, yeah. and, and rather than like this, I mean, it, it's interesting because that split is the Western split between matter and spirit. Right. Right? It, it's another big problem. It's so dualistic rather than a rainbow, like rather than a rainbow, if you will, of, of grades, of, of layers, of realms, of dimensions. It's like spirits over here, matters here, and there's no relationship. Yeah, up is them. good, down is bad. You or, know, or, or down is, is good and up is bad. Yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right. That, I mean, that's which yeah. which many would then then have all kinds of biases about. Oh, that's the Luciferian path. That's uh-huh. the and then all of these heretical dogmas mm-hmm. start to come in and start to fuck with the psyche, you know. And and but it's. Yes, it's like there needs to be there needs to be a, a kind of a reunion mm-hmm. of spirit and matter because yeah. that's the truth. Right. And I think this is a key thing that we were also talking about is first values, first principles. Yes. Truth of the truth of the cosmos, like mm-hmm. whether it's the Tao or whether it's Shekinah or whether it's mm-hmm. you know whatever the models are of right. depth Buddhism, yeah. and and then actually. Yes, you can you can embrace them through the flavor of whatever path you go, but actually they're all pointing to the same fundamental truths. That's right, and yeah. and like to uh, to illuminate those so that we're all actually understanding the game in the same way seems absolutely necessary. And I know right. this is your thesis, yeah. and, and I believe it as well. Absolutely necessary to actually address this existential crisis right. that we're steamrolling into. Right, right, right. There, there's a there's a deep structure of the human psyche. Right, and, and we know that's true of development from a Western perspective, and it's also true of development from these esoteric and mystical traditions. And we're, we are at a point where, and, and where we, where that just becomes a single developmental journey. Mm-hmm. And the, even the term spiritual doesn't quite talk to the fact that we're talking about like, what it means to unfold as a human being, yeah, right, and that that and that every tradition there are certain developmental um, processes that everybody goes through, and that goes through nearly every single tradition. And the more that we can understand that deep structure, the more we can we can stay true to what's human and not get lost in the paraphernalia of a tradition. Yeah. Because it's that's all too easy, right? Whether yeah. it's Christian or Jewish or Buddhist, is to get lost in the um, in the trinkets, right? Yeah. In, in the accoutrement, right? Yeah, that's right. And yeah. and I think you know you mentioned spiritual, and and the, also the problem with spiritual is it's been also left as separate, kept aside, kept in isolation, kept in in, in this kind of exiled box of this is spiritual, mm-hmm. this is profane. Mm-hmm. And then that leads to all sorts of spiritual materialism and all sorts of ways in which you actually start to divide the world into further pieces, which then right. causes the pieces to be right. at war with each other even further. Right. And, right, right. and this is, <laughs> I've, I've said this before, but I had another recent experience of it where obviously I get invited to a lot of, quote, spiritual circles. Poor, 
poor year. <laughs> <laughs> For real. That's it's some of my least favorite. It's some of my least favorite experiences because yeah. I sense the fraudulence mm. of of that experience, you know? And like so I'll find myself in the back, I'll find that one buddy or that one person that we can crack back, jokes he's with. Usually in the back row. In the back <laughs> row and we can kind of crack jokes. And sometimes we get shushed because someone's doing their fucking 14th invocation of some <laughs> other fucking and all that's great, and there's a place for it. And it's not like right. before ceremony, I won't open up the seven directions or no, things like that. Sure. You know, like I, I do deeply appreciate it, but it can easily get overdone and wrapped up in itself. Yeah. And then I'll have an experience like I did recently. I was just out in Tampa. I watched um, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers play Tom Brady and the Bucks. Great game, went out there. Also, Tampa is known to have the finest strip clubs in the country. That's the mm. reputation. So we decided, all right, let's check it out. Let's see what's going on. Went there with my wife and our friends. And that place was more like a church and more spiritual than any place. Now, this is not universal for strip clubs. No, I, will I, I, will tell, I will tell you that. Right. But from the person who met us at the door, who happened to, used to be an ex- you know, ex MMA fighter had followed me for a long time, was just like unbelievably overwhelmed and excited to see me to every host, to every waitress, to every dancer that we met who was just the energy. Yeah, there was there was some trauma under the surface there, sure. but they actually knew it and they were actually just loving and kind and excited and freely expressed through that. And it was a more spiritual experience truthfully I believe than you. most of the time yeah. i've spent in a lot of these other spiritual places and and i think in order to see that you have to go beyond the bias of oh well this is a spiritual thing and this is not that's right you know what i mean yeah. it, it's yeah. it's everywhere it's interfused in that's everything right. and when you have the eye for it and you, you can when you have the the palette for it mm. like oh here we are mm -hmm. like shekinah is here mm -hmm. like god is here mm -hmm. whatever your name is that's like right. here the christ is here like i i feel it you know, and, and that's that's where things get to be really beautiful. Yeah, to me, that's right. I mean, that's the real possibility that we have of sacred world. Like we, the world that we're wanting to build. I don't know if we want to get rid of the strip clubs, right? I mean, it's right. <laughs> evolve know, and, them. Evolve them, right? So, evolve so, them. So, but what, what I mean by that is, is that the sacred manifests itself through every every single kind of flower that mm. there is, every single kind of plant. Right from the meek to the extravagant, like yep. this is all, um, this is all part of the path. Right. This is the problem with as a Buddhist teacher. Like a lot of people have an idea of what Buddhist psychology is or what the path is, right? Because they see a lot of monks and it all looks very serious. <laughs> <laughs> like, it all looks of course, and, and look, you go to Thailand, and this is this is a bias that I'm in here. I went to Thailand, yeah. and I was with my partner at the time, who was Caitlin. And many people know Caitlin. She's been on the podcast. Yeah. And we went up, saffron robes, the whole deal. I believe that was the color in the, wherever we were, we were in sure. Samui. But whatever, they had a color. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was saffron. Could have been orange. Um, and I was giving a monetary exchange for some kind of kind of trinket thing that had a Buddha carving in sandstone or something yeah. like that. And she went to do the same. And they backed off because they couldn't touch her <laughs> hand. She couldn't give them money right. or, or anything because of the... And it was like, what? Like, what, right. is, what is wrong with you guys? Right, right, right. What? This doesn't make any fucking sense to me. So this is, you know, my friend, um, I think you know, you know of the work of Ken Wilber, right? I do. I think that um, you know, one of the things that he, in his work when he looks at levels of development, um, it's important to understand that uh, a psychotechnology can, be, can have been developed at a certain point of time with a very small percentage of people actually being able to, well, usually it's a very small percentage of people who have the capacity to design a path. Yeah. So it's one thing to be able to have the intelligence and the level of development to design it, but it's another thing than people who can teach that because you don't actually have to be as developed in order to teach it. Mm. So part of the research that we've done in terms of developmental research it indicates the most of the spiritual teachers that you see out there, developmentally don't actually scale very high on, on development. Usually their ego structure is pretty conventional. Mm. And this is where it gets very confusing for people because on one hand, maybe this teacher is teaching um, psychotechnology, meditative practices that are really potent, 
or um, serving really potent ayahuasca medicine. Yep. And like within a very specialized realm have this amazing capacity. And yet, if you ask them about day-to-day -day relationships or, or, or issues around like psychology and therapy, they have no clue. Yep. And this is, this is one of the, um, the insights of, of modernity, if you will, is that there are actual levels of ego development. Mm -hmm. And that the kind of spirituality that we're interested in isn't just about state development. It's about trait development. And trait development means that it actually changes our ego structure, mm. right? That it isn't just, I sit here, I go into a meditative state, and then I come back and I'm the same person, mm. right? That the, 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 structure, the structure of the ego n needs to transform. And we know it goes through a, a number of stages of, of growth. Yeah. And, that a, and that a practice that transforms the ego as well as giving access to these states is what we're, you know, it's what we're interested in. Yeah, I think it's, you know, on the plant medicine path. So you can shift your state by taking a medicine. Right. You're going to do it. It's going to be gonna successful. Happen, whether it's you gonna, like it or not. It's going to happen. <laughs> but the emphasis on integration yeah. is all about trait development. It's about like, all right, you know, as my friend Chris you know, Williamson will say, does it grow corn? Mm -hmm. You know, like what is, okay, great. You've had apotheosis you merged with the oneness of all beings right like now what like what does that change about your life like right. how does it and i i just had recently had a you know had a podcast where the virtue of plant medicines was challenged you know mm -hmm. and you know ultimately the the rebuttal was you know you shall know a tree by its fruits like for me like i know the fruits that yeah. have evolved my traits dramatically dramatically my kindness my compassion my ability to connect with people my you know self-acceptance self-love like i could go down the the whole list so i i you know do not accept right. <laughs> this crit right. this critique as if it's only about state temporary state development right this ha can also lead to trade development however right. it doesn't mean that it always will you have right. to you have to apply it and you have to integrate it yeah and it sounds like that's what you're talking about as well yeah that's right and, and well, if we look at the, the the Buddhist contemplative path, which is the one I know the most, like the, the typically the first way that we would like the first kind of the first learning, the first contemplative process is to is, it's called the nine stages of staying, and this is really about developing an an integrated a psyche that is stable and calm and integrated. Mm -hmm. And that has the capacity for peak performance, joy, happiness, integration, and equanimity. And that's that kind of practice is pretty universal, mm -hmm. right? It, 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 every, all the traditions have some variant of this kind of like calm staying practice because it's a contemplative practice that kind of that brings, um, brings the psyche together. Like helps us become more concentrated. Sure. Like who doesn't want to be able to be, you know, more integrated and not and not scattered, right? That's a um, that's a pretty universal uh, learning, sure. and it has nothing to do with uh, um, being an ascetic, right? It's got to do with as William Chain, William James put it, the great American psychologist, like the, the training and the education of the attention would be an education par excellence, mm. right? The so much suffering. I mean, I mentioned suffering that comes from a lack of a kind of integrated self image, but so much human suffering right now comes from a, like distractibility, right? And, yeah. and an attentional system that like goes all over the place. Well, and is it is starving like a, you know, you've, I don't know, I've, I've been with plenty of parties. Cocaine is not my, not my drug uh -huh. of choice, but right. you see somebody who's taken a few, you know, sniffs of, mm -hmm. sniffs of Coke and then they're searching for it the whole night. Like, right. and it's, you see that. And then, you know, perhaps I'm on like psilocybin or something mm -hmm. like that. And I'm looking at it at depth and mm -hmm. like seeing underneath it. I'm like, wow, 
Mm. This is this is a wild thing, but you can also see the same thing that people searching for dopamine in their other ways, whether it's the validation well, right. of the validation that's of right. their social media posts doing well, or some comment, or the pleasure of telling about yourself, or the pleasure of mm. all of these little pleasures that that people are seeking so rapidly and afraid of the homeostasis of staying yeah you know ultimately and you can start to like peer behind the veil of what's happening even in yourself so the first in a, in a universal system like the first thing that we need to master is dopamine right yeah. in, in terms of one of the one of the ways i look at the path is is first it's like you've got to either you're going to get dopamine through checking your cell phone or you're going to learn how to develop a, a state of engaged peak performance that keeps that system online, mm. right? And and that's like the first thing that we would train is, is kind of training the ability to to stay energized and stay engaged, which which is true if you're a professional sport, you know, footballer or, 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 a, or a brain surgeon, right? Yeah. That in fact, access to the peak of every field necessitates the ability to master that yeah right and and then if you keep continuing along that path then the next thing is well can you can you ease up on that throttle mm. right because one thing you got to throttle in to get the juice going mm -hmm. right you know you and i we got the juice going now yeah <laughs> now the question is is can we like ease up a little bit right and begin to let the let the mind like stay by itself uh. right and so in contemplative practice, the beginning involves learning how to throttle in, right? So that the mind is, you know, whether you're following a mantra or following the breath, and then learning to like kind of ease up and kind of come out of that. And once you get enough dopamine, then you can switch to the serotonin systems and then you can begin to use happiness and joy as a way of keeping, of getting the mind to stay. Yeah. Right. And it's whenever you, you start to look at the kind of codification of this is basic human operating system technology. That's right. And as William James alluded mm -hmm. to, what are we doing in school? Like, why are we not learning how to breathe, learning right. mantra practice, learning That's how right. to, you know, focus? Right. Even some of the another area, which I think is a part of this, and I don't know where Vipassana fits mm -hmm. into this practice, but I know and I haven't done it. Mm -hmm. And but I know it would be really helpful mostly because I can find myself slipping into being, uh, no offense to whores of all varieties, but a comfort whore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like where, like really, I'm in, if I find myself mildly uncomfortable, I will find a solution to that discomfort. A little bit tired, ah, oh, there's a solution, there's some <laughs> caffeine or there's some nicotine or, so, so almost just averse to discomfort. Unless I'm like in deep into my cold plunge practices or right. some other meditative right. practices where I'm actually actively working on it. But so easily weeks will go by and then I'll find myself. And actually I had this revelation, you know, today that like you're supposed to have this, but I was like, Demon Man. and mm -hmm. Burning Man was not interested in enduring any discomfort at all. <laughs> it was, it was the most pleasurable uh -huh. experience. I did a fucking phenomenal job of enjoying the fuck out of burning man and, and so no regrets there but it was a it was a pleasure parade it was all pleasure mm. all the time right and i used whatever substances necessary to maintain all pleasure all the time and it's you know had its integration and you know it's the things that came up afterwards whatever but then i never really got back into my practices uh-huh and i still have and i kind of been traveling well, a little bit yeah the, 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 the challenge of course so the is the momentum Right, right. So what you're describing is is like the first insight. The first insight in like is the insight into cause and effect. So, so the in the in the Buddhist tradition, there's like levels of insight. So, what is the insight into cause and effect? Well, it's the insight that if you do things with your body and your mind, a momentum builds up, and then you begin to recognize, like now this thing is going. Mm -hmm. And you're like, shit, where's my, like, I used to sit on my cushion and do, sit on my little yeah. stool and do some meditation, but actually the, the momentum, right, is, is moving, right, at such, that it's, it's difficult to even slow down the nervous system. Yeah. Because what happens is, is, is when you do that, you then begin to come into relationship with the reactivity. 
yeah. the, 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 which is what the Buddha called dukkha, mm. right? Dukkha basically translates as like re reactivity, which is basically our developmental trauma. Like whatever in the background we're doing to avoid what's going on here, that has a kind of reactivity to it because we don't, we don't, we're, we're avoiding the present moment. Yeah. Right. So the first, the beginning of the path is like developing that um, exposure therapy, if you will, to the present moment. Yeah. Right. Which is, which is why mindfulness. Even when the present moment is a little bit uncomfortable. Even when it's not uncomfortable. Especially. And I'm perhaps. sure all of, actually, I can't imagine that any of the wisdom that you learned from medicine, I don't imagine any of that came without actually moving towards the discomfort. Oh, of course not. The whole that's, thing was that's about the, it, right? That's the, yeah. that's what you aim for. You that's know, right. And that is like, all right, well, here's some, here's something to go. Let's go. That's right. Doesn't even mean if, that if even if it's, even it's bad, even if it's bad. The right? darkest star. I mean, I spent, yeah. there was set like a, at least a two month period where every, every journey, every experience I had was actually taking me into deeper levels of disgust and mm. horror, like mm. over and over. And mm. actually I just accelerated you know, the amount of ceremonial mm -hmm. access I had. Cause I was like, I gotta get to the you end of this thing. This. Right. You know, like I, had, I gotta keep going. And it's right. like, and, and it was harrowing. And like yeah. the journey was harrowing. I told some of this story on my podcast with uh, Dr. Dan Engel and, but I knew that I had to get through. And, and since then it's been in pleasurable. And so I think for me, that's been more consistent that I'm always willing to face that in mm -hmm. the kind of astral body. Right. But what I'll, what I'll also find like today, so the, just the quick anecdote from today is I finished my, you know, fit for service call, went a little late, but had some more questions, didn't feel like I could cut people off, knew that we had this podcast coming. Uh, and I still wasn't ready. I was actually took the call in my pajamas. <laughs> and, uh, and so I finished and I'm like, shit, I got to get going. Yeah. Um, our hot water takes probably like a minute to heat up. I was like, oh, fuck it, it's just cold shower. But it's been so long since I've been in the cold that I get in there and, I, and I'm like, and normally cold showers for me, it's like nothing. That's but right. I found myself like, and it was only because of the time pressure that I actually forced myself. And then finally I got used to it and I had the recognition like, wow, I, I, I walked up a frozen mountain with Wim Hof and, right. and cracked the ice and That's stayed right. underneath the water, fully submerged for two and a half minutes and in there for 10 minutes. And now look at me being a shivering, a shivering little wimp. That's right. In That's this, right. in this one little mildly cold shower, and like how quickly I had adapted to a new set of physical pleasure, and it was just really eye-opening moment of like, all right, get back. To, in my in my way, that's like get back to your fucking cushion, bro. That's right, and, and so that's the wis So that's the wisdom of cause and effect. Like you, you get it. Like you're getting like you're getting how that works. Yeah. The thing. The, the next thing is like the what they call the lam rim or the graduated path, which is like, if that's true, then, then there's, little, there's little steps, little causes that go all the way up. It was worked out by, you know, by, the, by these contemplative scientists that, because once you, once you get it going, it isn't that difficult, right? right? Like I'm, I'm, a, it, I'm out there in like, you know, cold Boulder, Colorado, cracking the ice. You know, my my, my son Bodie is out there sitting in the cold tub, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, so this is the same thing with the mind. Mm. Like, I mean, that's that's the beauty of Buddhist contemplative science. Yeah, is if you want, first is, is to understand that it is a science. So it's it's technical because you know it involves very very subtle shifts in in metacognition, mm -hmm. but that can take you all the way, actually quite quickly, if it's done, if you use cause and effect, right? If, if you're haphazard, or if the teacher isn't really clear with the instructions, it can be, well, it can be more than two, three decades and you get nowhere. On the other hand, if the instructions are really clean, you can achieve in a week what some people can take decades to achieve. So this podcast and pretty much everything I do is made possible by Onnit. And the great thing about Onnit is it's a company where I created all of the best products that would support me in a holistic life 
physically, mentally, through all of the human optimization technologies that Onnit offers and is available. And this ranges from kettlebells to the steel clubs, the steel maces to the alpha brain, which I use before every podcast and the shroom tech, which I use before every workout and the total NO that I use when I want to flex in the gym and have a really good workout. Really everything that I've ever wanted from a human optimization standpoint is offered through Onnit. So I encourage you guys to check it out. Go to onnit.com slash Aubrey and you'll save 10% off absolutely everything and thank you for your support of On It, which is directly support to me. Thanks, fam. If you if you could go through a link, go through the link of cause and effect it, that could be like a productive way to progress using the cause and effect path. So so let's take the this is one example of one path, right? Um, one contemplative path. So the first thing is is the stabilizing of the mind, mm-hmm. right? Because if we want to look any deeper into our experience. If our mind is all over the place, right, we're not gonna be able to, to do that. So, you know, let's say we, we're sitting down and the first thing that we're gonna sit down with is we're gonna feel the, you know, the sensations of our body, mm-hmm. right? So we, we start with the sensations of the body you know, and, and then we introduce the breath. And then we're learning to develop um, an intensity of engagement Right, because in order to stay with something, and I'm sure that you've learned this in your work, right? And your friend Aaron, I'm sure, knows this. Is like you, you got to you, you got to be on it, right? Oh yeah. Okay. So first, you got to be willing to sit down, and then the next stage is practicing being on it, mm. which is basically the dopamine mm. piece, right? And you can take your supplements if you need to, right, mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to facilitate that. Once that, once you can like throttle in and you can stay, then you're learning to like ease up on that throttle mm-hmm. so that you don't, and what happens is the mind begins to stay by itself. Mm-hmm. So once you get the mind to be able to stay by itself, now we can do, now we can do inside practice, right? So what's, what's inside practice? Well, the, it's understood in, in Buddhist psychology that the cause of suffering is due to fusion, confusion, right? Mm. When the field of awareness, this unbounded openness that's our true spirit right here, right now, it becomes fused with the attentional system, right? So we can notice this right now, even in our visual field, right? So awareness is perceiving the whole room right now, Mm. right? We have peripheral vision, but that peripheral vision has been recognized by awareness. And then we've got our attentional system that is like locking on. Right. Okay. Most people are fused with the attentional system. So that is very, very, you know, at a very simple level. Yeah. Right now, as we're gazing at each other, how we look at each other is who looking, is who is looking at each other. Right, so when we start letting in more information to come from that peripheral vision, there's 11 million bytes of information flowing in through that whole field. There's 22 bytes of information flowing through the attentional system. So most people are going through their day like this. They go from one thing to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. So much of the shift that you've experienced in your life, even if you didn't recognize it, was beginning to pe- about learning to perceive that field. Yeah. I mean, you know what I'm talking about because you're doing it right now. Yeah. And actually that you recognize that you are that field. Yeah. So you, you can get that, that the factory settings of survival fuse awareness to that attentional system. Trauma, like what the fuck is going on here? Right. So that's where the, the source of suffering comes from that fusion with the attentional field. Um, and the attention is at the center, it's the central mechanism of the self structure. You and I maintain our sense of self through what we attend to. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? So we attend to a certain narrative and that main t- that's what we're attending to. We attend to certain sensations. Oh, I don't like those ones. I like those ones. Right. It's, I mean, would another way to describe this be our our personal story? And I don't say this in the postmodern kind of denigration of story, yeah. but in yeah. like like that we are a we are a plot line. 
that's kind of moving and that's what we're we're kind of we can get too narrowly focused on the the story that's already been written rather than the story that we are capable of currently writing there's a there's a story that's part of it there's also the somatic element meaning our ego structures tend to inhabit our bodies based on what Wilhelm Reich called our, our body armor, our character structure. So there's even certain sensations right now that like that you might let in because like, oh yeah, that's part of who I am. And like, other <laughs> sensations where you're like, oh, I'm not letting that in because that's not who, right. So it's almost like a, like Huxley's cognitive filtering device, yes, like mechanism. Right. It's a somatic filtering we, mechanism. So we got a, we have a somatic filtering system. We've got a narrative filtering system, mm. right? You've got an affective one. But all of that is based on that little cursor that you moves around, right? Like, what are you gonna click and open up? It's all based on the attentional system, mm -hmm. right? So that's why they say in the Zen tradition, like the, 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 uh, the, the, deepest, um, the deepest ego structure is the witness. So people often talk about the witness as being like the witness consciousness being a high state. It's true, but it's also actually the pure attention is also pure ego. Mm. So anyway, so. Wow, it, and is that because that's, that attention is perspectival? Yeah. Yeah. But it's because you get fused to it. Uh -huh. the fu it's the fusion to the attentional system that causes the whole cascade of suffering and including in that cascade of suffering is losing all those higher dimensions of being, mm -hmm. right? It all comes from the fusion with the attentional system. <laughs> so that's from the so that's the top down perspective. Right? I think one of the one of the ways that the plant medicine path has been so illuminating is it is it breaks these bonds of fusion. That's exactly what it does. And it's it's so it's so wild to yeah. me. I mean, so one of the medicines that I engage with is five uh, meo DMT yeah. bufo. And so in that experience, it's pure apotheosis really. Mm. And, and it's for me, some, this is my own experience, but I have the same experience every time. Yeah. It is not, it is not varied from the same experience. It's, it's the all of everything all at once mm -hmm. and I'm experiencing it all. And it's all the pain, all the joy, all the laughter, all the ecstasy, it just, and it's just God. And every time I do it, mm. I go, oh, I forgot again. I forgot again. <laughs> so what you're, what you're describing, Aubrey, is the recognition of wholeness. Right. So, so this is where we go. The, the, there is a, so there's a, there is a, 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 a cognitive, metacognitive training so that you don't forget. Yeah. Right? Um, but the mechanism that you're describing there is, is that if wholeness, and, the, and this is where the beauty of, of the world comes back in, because that understanding of the sacred of sacredness is not about an abstraction it's about the fullness of experience yeah and what happens when you take plant medicine is it floods your experience floods your experience and it breaks open that filter so that you start perceiving holistically holographically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and aside from aside from whatever else it does in terms of what material it might bring up it breaks open the awe, one of the, one of the ways they described that a realized consciousness operates is the, is the profound innocence of an infant that's like walked into a temple for the first time. Like that, that sense of wondrousness is a, is a, it's a way, it's a metacognitive, it's a way of understanding how to get your mind to op, your, your mind can operate like that without any medicine. And that's and and that would be the fucking dream because that's right. I just mentioned Burning Man was the most pleasurable experience of my life, <laughs> and through my own, you know, I have a, a consistent kind of practice, mm -hmm. medicine, and I have my ayahuasca retreats and things sure. I go to more sparingly, but a more consistent practice is the utilization of ketamine and cannabis, mm -hmm. and it it springs me mm -hmm. with my participation into a state where I right. can perceive the world with awe and wonder. Well, Burning Man is a playground mm -hmm. of available awe and wonder, but I went three years, mm -hmm. I maybe touched a little bit of, oh, that's a cool piece of art. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at, look at that, this thing glow, this thing lights mm -hmm. up. Well, I missed it. I honestly, I missed it. I missed Burning Man, I didn't get it. I had a couple big parties, I had some you know, cool experiences, it was wild, it was fun, I had some good laughs. 
but I missed it. I missed the point. But with the help of my own dedicated prayer and mm-hmm. these medicines, I was able to maintain, mm-hmm. again, support it, but I was able to maintain a level of awe and wonder where I was going around giddy right. at right. every new little surprise that mm-hmm. I found like, oh my God. <laughs> this is unbelievable. That's Do right. you guys see this? Right, right. And I was like laughing and joking and mm-hmm. and it was, you know, it was an infectious kind of feeling. And and of course, like many of us found ourselves in that state as well because mm-hmm. those that kind of consciousness gets sure. infective. And of course, other people would sometimes lead the dance in that way as well. But to imagine living like that without having to, you know, rely on the medicines. Mm-hmm. Whoa! Right. Like, so what a what a fucking paradise! So that's what, a what we're interested of heaven. in. That's what we're interested in. Yeah. Right. So just the, the well, let's 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 continue the journey I was describing. Yeah, please. Right. So once the mind is relatively stable, and you can you can use like meditative practices for that, but you can also use energetic practices like you know, <sighs> you know breath practices sure. because once you have a certain amount of energy, as you well know, the mind just starts to settle down. Mm-hmm. That's when the, the journey of, of insight practice begins. And it's important to understand that in the Buddhist psychotech, there are three main revolutions of technology, just like how technology, you know, you go from the industrial age to the information age. Buddhist tech has, has evolved through different cycles. And so you, you're going to want to know, I'm going to be speaking more from the latest tech perspective, right, which is... Um, the Vajrayana perspective, the the third turning, and and then perhaps this, this next coming fourth turning. Um, so there, the the insight practice is you're you're looking into um, to see how uh, this fusion that uh, that appears to be apparent is is actually just an illusion. Mm-hmm. So the first kind of, the, the first insight practices are, for instance, to look into the apparent boundaries of the body. Like the, the body's, your experience of your body is formatted by your self-image, mm-hmm. right? So if you actually have a concentrated mind and you start exploring the, the boundaries, well, what happens is you begin to realize that actually you can feel beyond your body. Right, quite. It's not. It's not difficult to do. You're, you're deconstructing the bodily experience, and you're beginning to feel like there's a field around you. And I'm yeah. sure you've, of course, you've had experiences like that. Of course, right. Once we do that, then we can even look into the structure of the self itself. This narrative structure. So, insight practice is is like a, a search. It's a deconstructive search because you're searching for something that actually under the weight of investigation, you're not gonna find, right? Meaning that you know, based on the little physics that you know, right, quantum physics and what have you, that actually there can't be a boundary of the body because if you go deep enough, it's just gonna expand into the field around you. Mm. So that we call the view. So that's the view, that's what would be true of everything. So let's start with the self-structure, like Aubrey and John, you know, like there's something that I'm like, it's like Gollum, <laughs> in, in, in like, my precious. My precious. <laughs> it's like, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. <laughs> right? So, so if, you, if you can work with your precious, and then you, you, in a meditative state, you start looking for where can you find the precious, what will happen, of course, is because the precious is held together by the attentional system, right? It, it's, it's, it's not actually a sustained structure. It's just like a... It's like the coagulation of information. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, like the people who take Coumadin because their blood is all like gooped up. Part of mental suffering is because the information of our sense of experience gets gooped up. So much so that you start taking Aubrey to be serious or John to be like, and I'm gonna fucking defend, <laughs> I'm gonna fucking defend him, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And he's entitled to Absolutely. this thing this. It's and mine. How dare the world not <laughs> Give me the you know obeisance that it, that this this being right. deserves. Right. Right. You know, like how dare you is always right. what the ego shouts. Yeah, that's right. So when you when you search into the body and you search into the self structure, very quickly, it reveals that they're unfindable. Yeah. And what that then allows you to do is to affirm that there's a level of awareness 
that is operating that's beyond that structure, right? That's, that's, that's always already right here. So that's the first structure that we wanna look into. The, the next structure has got to do with duality. Like that we like. How does this does this map to the to the four turnings? Because we talked about getting to that. Yeah, or is yeah. that kind of is that yeah. kind of different? Yeah. So okay. So the fir the first turning is is in a very simplified way. It's got to do with like from 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 the uh, from the Indo Tibetan perspective is like reactivity. So coming into the present moment and having a real relationship with your reactivity, so you're no longer moving away from it but you're moving towards it, okay. which is what you described as the, the momentum that's so difficult. Mm -hmm. What helps with that is perspectives that come from these later teachings, which is like, if I said to you that that runaway train, that that momentum wasn't just you, it was the, run, the runaway train that is destroying the civilization. Mm -hmm. If you were able to recognize holographically and this goes back to the personal being like the universal. So this is the, the Christ. Atman is Brahman. Yeah. This is the Christ view. So, so Christ would be like, actually this, this agitation I'm feeling, this momentum is what's burning down the Amazon forest. Mm. And when, I, when we begin to have a relationship with our own interior experience holographically, and we take the responsibility, then sitting on your, then sitting down will mean more to you than, than if it was just for you. Yeah. So, the, so this is what they call the Mahayana frame, which is the first turning, the frame was very much about individual practice, individual reactivity. And then the Mahayana, Maha, Maha means great, the great vehicle, which is a universal vehicle. Great meanings, if you see it in, in, in Christians or Jews or Hindus, anybody who gets to a place of practice where they realize it's about all of us, mm -hmm. that's the Mahayana. So the Mahayana is about recognizing- and like, that's the second turning? That's the second turning. Yeah. So that happened about 400 years after the Buddha passed away. And this was when practice was no longer ascetic. It was about, hey, if we can see, we, this is inseparable from the field. And if that's true, it changes the motivation for why you would practice. And frankly, makes it much easier, right? Because for some of us, it's easier to do things to help others than to like, than ourselves. If we realize like it actually all depended upon you, Aubrey, <laughs> right? That you would be like, you'd be sitting down. You'd be like, because you, you recognize that momentum is what's like chainsawing. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Right. So that second turning is about understanding emptiness. So emptiness is this understanding that everything is constructed. So that the body is constructed, that the self is constructed. And that actually, if you penetrate deep into the construction, what you find is the fundamental openness of reality. Now that openness, so what's interesting is that teaching, it sounds very like masculine, but in India, this was presented as a teaching of the goddess. Like, so the philosophical teachings of emptiness of Shunyata were the, the teachings of Prajnaparamita, which was the Indian version of Sophia. Mm. So when we're talking about philosophia, the love of wisdom, Sophia here means the wisdom of appreciating that actually every structure is actually fundamentally open to the, to the whole of reality. Mm. And that fundamentally changed the spiritual- and, and open to be fucked open to an even deeper reality. Yes. By all of the cosmos. But that's right, exactly. That actually, it was a radical change because it changed spiritual practice to be a recognition that we could go deep into spirit through the world that if the world is, if Sophia is open, if, if actually the body's, the body's boundaries, if you penetrate deep enough, there is no boundary, then the invitation is, fuck man, get as deep as you possibly can into your experience. Mm -hmm. Because it's in the depth of experience that it's actually open. Yeah. As opposed to earlier models where I'm gonna remove myself. 
So that practice of, of emptiness, which is a uniquely, that is a uniquely Buddhist insight. It's like a contemplative uh, insight was like, we're gonna go deep and penetrate into experience, not go up, but essentially go in. Mm -hmm. And that leads to the fundamental openness of everything. Mm -hmm. So that would include, for instance, in our direct experience, you then apply that as a contemplative practice. So it becomes an injunction to, to apply. And if you apply these injunctions, they become realizations, which means they get wired into your, to your brain. So for instance, one of the ways that we suffer is that we, like you and I, our habitual mode of operating is we feel like there's a boundary between the two of us. In, in our sense perception, right? But if we actually examine right now as we're looking at each other, like where does, where does the outside world end? And where does like awareness behind the eye begin? And you start search, kind of like searching like that apparent bound. <laughs> what happens when you when it you search? Weird. <laughs> it gets weird, right? It gets, so, in a cool way. In yeah. a cool way. Because we just did it for like, that's why you uh -huh. laugh, because yeah, we did yeah. it for like two seconds that's, and it's already starting to so get like, weird. So what do you notice when you look for the boundary? <sighs> it's It's, you start to see yourself looking back at you. <laughs> There's no, <laughs> and it becomes fractal. Right, right, right. In that's this way, right. it's like, well, this yeah. goes on forever. That's, 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 it's you looking at me. There's no inside. There's no outside. Yeah, okay. it's like, what is going? Yeah, but that, yeah. So that realization, if I work at it, that's a permanent. It becomes a permanent trait, mm. right? So there's no inside. There's no outside. And then if you also open up that kind of wide, the, the width at the same time, like you're you're swallowing it all, but it's not even out there. You can immediately notice how that shifts your 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 state of of your basis of operation, like who yeah. you think yourself to be. Yeah. It washes the self structure out. Right. Right. And if we do that auditorily as well, and this is always strange because, like, if where does the outside the world that we're listening to end and like inside begin? I mean, if you like with your right ear, if you could, well, there's the sound in my right ear, and I kind of go go in, but where does that stop? Mm. Where, where does it, you see, where does it, right? Now, so where does that right side become the left side? Where's, where does left become right? Right. Right? <laughs> so you can, what you begin to experience is, is the- world of vibration. The fundamental openness of your experience that's, right. that's always right here. So that kind of practice is done, right? In, which, is, which actually isn't very difficult. Right, if it's pointed out the right way, it isn't very difficult. Mainly because it's the way things are. Yeah, it's not. So this is the important thing: is is that that there's a misnomer around contemplative practice that it takes, like you know, what is it? Mary Oliver, the poet, said is like crawling on your hands and knees through the te through the desert, like whipping yourself. It's going to be like this. You're gonna to have to go into some cave and, and- 30 years. 30 years, right? But actually what Buddhist contemplative psychology says is actually it's already like that. It's, it's already fundamentally open. Yeah, it's, it's remembering instead of learning something new. It's remembering. And if you can, and that's a very different kind of learning because you can't fail. <laughs> Right, I mean, because it's already like that. It, yeah. it, it, like it's you know, it, it's already fundamentally open. Yeah. So that those kinds of practices, that's what we call the the second turning, the Mahayana. Yeah. And when that gets stabilized, which which it will, developmentally, it shifts you to a well, that 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 open, wondrous state that you were mentioning. If that became a permanent trait. Right, which a year or two, three years of practice, it, it can become a permanent trait. Now you are at a different developmental level as difference between a five-year-old and an adult. Mm. And like, we're talking a real struct, a real shift in, in structure, a real, yeah. sh a real shift in your operating system. Totally. Now, what's super curious, it was super interesting about what happens now is how the mind can function once it operates at that level, mm -hmm. right? Because it isn't just about that fundamental field. Is like, 
if you've shifted your, your basis of operation, then the mind is now liberated from being held onto. So that make, like, mm -hmm. right? So it's no longer, it's not your mind anymore. I mean, it operates within you, but it's more like cloud-based computing. Yeah, well, look, I, I have a very uh, mildly painful and very real experience with this because I uh, endeavored to write a book called Master Your Mind, uh -huh. Master Your Life. And ultimately, after three failed attempts that each reach 50,000 words, I realized, what the fuck am I trying to do? It doesn't ever end. Right. You know, and then I read the Kabbalion, and the first principle is all is mine, the universe is mental. And I was like, son of a bitch, I could have just read that a little bit earlier, and I could have changed the title of my right. book, and it just saved me a lot. Of, but I'm glad I pursued it, trying to find the boundary of uh -huh. the thing and the thing that could master the thing that was, that was bounded, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was yeah. futile. Right. And I was like, okay. Right. So now I have a vastly different understanding of the mind. And so when I hear somebody, used to hear like somebody talking about non-attachment to your thoughts, mm -hmm. like allow the thoughts come mm -hmm. in as you would allow, you know, a, a leaf to cross through a river mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and let them pass with love. Ram Dass right. is great sure. at you know, poetically describing right. this. And it's helpful actually in that, but it's not helpful until you actually understand the nature of the mind that contains the potentiality at the very least for all thoughts and all all things and it's just kind of what you're tuned into it's That's more right. like a, a receiver so so that there are so this is this is actually this is halfway up the ladder now this this level of mind we're talking about is halfway up the ladder amazing i made right? it to 12. that's great yeah that's great <laughs> no but this is this is but but the truth is if is if humanity was able to shift development to that level that would be enough to change the planet yeah because what will ha well, you've obviously experienced experienced intuitive insight in your in your life and in Absolutely. your work, right? Things just come out of nowhere. Yeah, and uh, you've also probably also experienced significant synchronicities. So, the the operating system of that level of of mind that is liberated from being fused to thought, it becomes what we call in the Buddhist tradition direct, valid, non conceptual cognition which means it becomes pure mainlined intuition. Like <laughs> you're, not, you're not storing anything in, in your, on, the, on your laptop anymore. You got a straight intuitive direct knowing into the interconnected field. And this, interestingly, this at Burning Man, when I was mm -hmm. springing myself with my own, you know, psychotechnology, uh -huh. psychedelic psychotechnology, yeah. I would spring myself into that and I was so, tuned into the like the frequency of synchronicity yes that unbelievably right. magical things that's right. that's were happening right. regularly right. and then if i slipped off it i could feel that i was off it i was like oh, i was out of the i was out of the field and and we would find ourselves riding to the trash fence or going yeah some we've other all had that on the trip right suddenly it's yeah. like why am i here this is this is like okay let's yeah. get back let's that's get right. back to openness that's to right. this and it was really it was unbelievable what would what the synchronicities that would happen you know so, well, we got to go back right. to the R, right, we got to right. go back to the rv and then i met this pro basketball player that was just uh -huh. happened to be needing right. to go to the bathroom right. at this time but was set an intention to find me on the playa and i'm riding to my rv right. he's going right. he goes does anybody know where a restroom is I'm like oh i'm fucking going in here you want to do this and he goes aubrey marcus <laughs> Eighty thousand people there and and like right. out of the blue i was like I, we got to go back to the rv like right. you need to go to the bathroom he's like no but like okay. uh, we got to go back. So that so the third le the third level or the third the third turning of the wheel is is when that magic like as that magic but as that realization becomes stabilized then the recognition of your of your realization is based on your activity on basically what kind of magic are you able to to manifest <laughs> yeah. right? I mean that's that's the applicability. So the applicability of the of the cha that change of consciousness is its ability to to be able to manifest as part of the whole, right? So when you stabilize, which you will stabilize that realization, yeah, I that realization that stabilizes as long as the motivation is also towards serving the whole. Mm -hmm. So there's a motivational piece there as well, which is what which is the ethical dimension. And which is, I think, something that people try to by bypass in their manifestation practices, whether it's through sex magic or uh -huh. whether it's through whatever practice, they're taking a, a lower base level motivation. I mm -hmm. wanna get rich for this thing. Sure. I want this thing to, 
And so they're, and they're trying to manifest the magic of a level of consciousness that actually aligns your motivations with the motivations of the cosmos mm -hmm. in a conversation. That's and this right. is the, in the Kabbalist lineage practice, they call it birur, mm -hmm. you know, the, the practice of clarifying your desire so mm -hmm. that you actually form an identical desire with your desire merging with the cosmos, not your desire being effaced and only serving the cosmos, that's, but your desire right. participating that's right. in the field that's right. of desire with yeah. a capital D. Yeah, so, so in, the for, in the fourth turning, if you will, there's a recognition that the planet is a single organism, a single mm. intelligence, and that it, you know, it, it is in the process of attempting to give birth to a new, a new civilization. And that that process that you and I are participating in, that, that what you're doing with your work, is part, of, is part of putting those various pieces in place to make that happen. That's happening at a, at a planetary level with a, with a huge intelligence that's integrating and holding everything at once. And to the extent that we're able to keep that field open, you're able to start dancing with the whole. And, and dancing with the evolutionary desire. So this is the, the planetary logos itself. The sacred has a desire. We call that evolution, <laughs> right? The shekhinah, the, the, the shakti, the evolutionary drive yeah. of reality, it wants to go somewhere. And our personal deepest pur purpose, and I don't mean purpose in a kind of like, just in an altruistic way, but like, What's deepest in our guts, in Aubrey and John's guts, is actually the coding for that, right? That, that by coming the most, by individuating as much as you possibly can, by becoming who you are as a unique individual, as deeply as you possibly can, actually paradoxically is also in service of that greater intelligence if you're able to hold both at the same time. Right. Right, so this is where the, the, the tantric path is like, are you able to like maintain like the, like the wings of an eagle wide open, that wide open view and penetrate as deeply as we can into like human intimacy and relationship and have both of those two happening at the same time. And then as you know, th that's when the magic happens. Right. 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 Yeah, this is, uh, you know, I think in, <clears throat> in Gaffney's work, what I've encountered is, and we talked about this briefly is, the teachings of unique self. Mm -hmm. And it's very much in alignment with that is actually clarifying your desire and understanding your unique self and understanding that the divine Shekinah mm -hmm. desires you to actually open up to the fullness of who you are. Right. And that is participating in the evolution of yeah. God, it, God itself. There's more God to come and it's right. you actually, you know, stepping into your uniqueness, which is also interconnected with, with the everything. With, every, with everything. So in, in, the old, in the old Buddhism, we would have been, we would have had an initiatory ceremony and we would have crowned you and anointed you, right? And uh -huh. so of course, the anointed one is what Christ, Messiah means an anointed one, right. right? So we would have an initiation ceremony and you'd be initiated as a Messiah, as all the other Messiahs, like sitting in the, in the circle of Messiahs, which would mean that now what you are saying, that, evolution is now comp is up to you mm -hmm. so so what that because because you is both lowercase you and uppercase you and both both at the same right? time exactly and your unique perspective and this is i think another great teaching of this lineage is that when you're in that state it's your right to be able to rewrite the torah yes because what was codified for a different time and a different That's person right. in a different place no longer has to be applicable for this time, this That's place, right. when you're in ontic identity with the divine and yourself, right. you then get to rewrite the Torah. And that's the very nature of the messianic yes. consciousness, which is flip those tables over, they no longer apply, they don't make sense anymore. Mm -hmm. So now let's step into a new consciousness as I'm in connection with the divine. However, for empire, mm -hmm. that's a fucking problem. Okay, so, th so this is, yeah, so the, that was always a problem for empire. <laughs> and, 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 and exactly because, well, first thing, if you put that pressure on the psyche, if you've, if you've had a good training, if you have good teachers, and then you have that initi initiation so that you're not gonna, that you can handle the pressure because now you're putting, that's what makes a diamond is pressure. So the Vajrayana, the diamond path, and I'm sure um, brother 
um, Gaffney has his own version of that, is about applying then like existential pressure to create that diamond in a single lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. Which means taking the responsibility of that freight chain within our body minds as like, as being like, oh my God, that's connected to everything. Then these traditions were all about <laughs> revolution, yeah. right? They were about like the, the, the Tibetan Buddhist academy was about generating heroic altruists, <laughs> right? Like this is really, it's, you know, the, the mythology of the fourth turning is really about, it's like the mythology of, of Shambhala, of, of the, the kind of return of the rainbow warriors, so to speak. And the fact that all of this psychotechnology is to help facilitate a revolution of consciousness and creativity and, 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 and love. Yeah. And the willingness and, you know, to, to bring in, to evoke the warrior ethos. I mean, oftentimes we think of warriors with swords and warriors with, and, and that's his one model of, mm -hmm. of warrior actually going to war. Sure. But you talk about some of the great warriors of all time. Think of Kwang Duk, mm -hmm. you know, sitting and having gasoline poured yeah. around him and in his, in his contemplation and in his, in his practice and in his whatever state that he mm -hmm. arrived at and then lighting himself on fire right. and right. just staying there and not wailing and not saying anything. I mean, that's, that's a rainbow warrior. That is, yeah. You know, on, yeah. A, on a level. And if you really connect to that, it's just like, whoa, that's another, that's another fucking level. And with no hope, no hope for self survival, no. no hope. Just no. I make a stand here, that's right? And I make that's a stand right. because it matters. Because my story includes my death, that's right. And that's another piece that you know that Gaffney helped was just mentioned recently. Like when your story includes your death, and also transcends your yeah, death. Yeah, fuck yeah, we're going, we're going on, we're going, we're going, we're going forwards, we're going, we're going all, all the way, baby. All the, I'm participating that's in right. the evolution that goes beyond. <laughs> that's this right, simple, exactly. Simple life. Yeah. So, so in the in in the in the planetary dharma tradition that I that I teach, like that, there's a there's what we call father tantras and mother tantras. It's like for those of us who got daddy issues and mummy issues. <laughs> <laughs> so look, this is the, the so the the mother tantra is um, well, you love the mother tantra. So the mother tantra is about basically um, the trans the transformation of desire. Uh -huh. Right, that if you if you if you fully embrace and transform desire, desire opens into that openness. Yeah. So the the mother tantra practices are about uh, sex, sexuality, plant medicine, massage therapy, mm -hmm. everything that helps us like Im deeply embody and and then by embodying actually paradoxically transcend mm -hmm. because we're so open. Right, we, we're so fluid. We're we're so able to just let everything move that that there's nothing, there's no grab, and that's like in my mind, that's like the that's the sacred village that we're all like. That's where I want to live, man. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. I want to live <laughs> totally right. But then the village needs to be protected by the father, by the the father principle. So the father principle is about the the transmutation of aversion, which is basically the transmutation of the fight flight mechanism. Right. Essentially, it's about the transmutation of fear and uh, the transmutation of the trauma of war and the trauma of violence and of death. So one of the one of my favorite um, tantric deities of the father class is called a uh, death destroyer, Yamantaka. Mm. And these are practices about um, through invocative practice, through envisionment practice. So, you know, you're envisioning yourself to essentially be like a demonic being. So first this is done from the basis of operation of being the fundamental field, right? Mm -hmm. So we're the fundamental field right now, right? And our heart is like the sun, fully motivated for that universal compassion. But now, like, you know, this is like industrial strength shadow work. Because we're not talking about dredging up a, few, a little bit of shadow. We want to go all the way fucking down mm -hmm. to, the, to that dinosaur that exists at the back of our brains, right? And if you can penetrate that deep, there's a huge amount of, of vitality that could be transmuted. That all that fear can be transmuted into aliveness, right? Mm -hmm. And that aliveness is what creates the clarity of the mind. When aliveness is transmuted in consciousness, it becomes clarity. 
So the mother tantras open into the fundamental openness. The father tantras transmute fear into clarity. That clarity is what becomes in the intelligence. And it also, because however deep you and I are willing to go, and Alan, tell me if this is true in your experience, into recognizing our own darkness, suddenly we start seeing it out there in the world. Meaning the father tantra helps you see the structure of empire in that how deep that goes into the, like, because most people are, are, are actually unconsciously scared of seeing the matrix. And also particularly scared seeing, the mat seeing that darkness as self. Well, that's right. And that's where it gets real scary because we all want to be good. We all want to be, you know, St. Michael or St. George or so, you know, some archangel, uh -huh. all good right, all the right, time. Right. But yeah, this is Hell's Angels practice. We don't, we don't recognize that <laughs> right. however you go in the polarity towards that angelic form, there's also your opposite polarity that exists right. within you. And I, I had a right. really prescient moment mm. of seeing that because... I've become very aware of the capability of my light in mm -hmm. that way. And then the, the medicine path showed me myself as a monster yeah. as well. Yeah. And it was not just any little, oh, that's a little cute little demon that likes to fuck or like, like, likes, to, <laughs> likes to eat naughty foods or something like that. No, mm -hmm. it was a black hole with teeth. <laughs> It was a. It was like a giant black hole with teeth that right, just right, wanted right. to devour right. everything right. and destroy, right, and right, it wanted right. to. And I was like, "Oh, oh man!" Like that's, that's me right. too. It was that's like, right. "Damn it!" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Then, but then in embracing that, mm -hmm. it was like, "Oh, there was a new freedom that kind of so developed, that and, and actually right. a choice for goodness." Yeah. Rather than yeah. an innate, just oh, right. I just am good. No, 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 it was a choice. No, 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 it was no, like, no, no, yeah, I could also be this monster right, with right. teeth, but right. th what the world needs, tapping into the field, yes, what the world needs is not the devouring monster of teeth, is, at least right now. Mm -hmm. It needs this other thing. So yes, a and what the what we do in the father tantras is, that in order to integrate, you need a symbol. Mm -hmm. um, symbols are what facilitate integration. Yeah. And, and the ultimate symbol is the self. This goes back to the self-image. So you see, once you've recognized the fundamental openness of the field, you begin to realize now that you can be creative. This is what we call creation stage meditation. So creativity would mean, okay, if I'm the fundamental field, I can now manifest in my self-image any way that I want to. <laughs> so when you see the very wrathful deities in Tibetan Buddhism, these are symbols of like, of symbolic representations of if you were to completely integrate your demonic being into a Buddha, what does that look like? So you have a symbol that integrates the darkest fucking badass, like deepest, darkest parts of the psyche with the angelic, and those are fused together as a symbol. So then when you're in meditation, you can learn to generate that huge energy because the darkness has the power, right? So you're able to generate that huge potency that comes from the darkness with a heart that is like full of universal compassion and a, and a, and a mind that is completely fundamentally open to reality. Yeah. And that's when you get some serious juice, right? Yeah. And that's the juice that the revolutionary, that the, revo you know, that the, that the, re the rebellion needs because if you're going to go against like empire, you know what empire very skillfully did is like, if I tell you what's sacred, if I tell you what's healthy, if I tell you what's valuable, if I just tell you those things, you, you're like, I've captured you without even having to capture you. Yeah. What empire did was, did was cut power away from wisdom and compassion. So we have practices, you know, we think of wisdom and compassion and spirituality, and over here is power left in the darkness, which is where empire gets to experience the potency of the spiritual dimensions of power, which is particularly like the magical dimensions. And then over here, we have the light chasers, who actually, because they're never gonna have enough power, they aren't threatening. <laughs> But when you do the father tantra, you're going to bring those together 
right? And that's where you get Jesus in the fucking temple, right? Kicking over the, the tables <laughs> and like, yeah, right? Which is, which is what we're gonna, we're gonna which, all need yeah, that. And the, and the lineage word is tekufot, which is the sacred audacity. It's sacred like- Sacred audacity. Like tekufot. It's tekufot. when you like, you know that you're, you're in divine accord uh-huh. and you do what is necessary in right. that moment. Right. And it's oftentimes messianic or revolutionary, mm-hmm. as you said, but you're filled with that knowing that this is right. That's right. You know, and I know that this is right. Mm-hmm. And it's not because I'm angry or it's not because of, it's because it's right. Right, right, and right. then that gives you a, a fills you with a holy fire that's mm-hmm. that's different than that's right. than anything than anything else. That's that's the Kundalini fire, right? So yeah. so within Buddhist contemplative tech, once you've stabilized that bodhisattva mind, then you can unleash. Then essentially, you've built an alchemical container that's safe. That's why w- w- maybe when you look from the outside of Buddhism, you see monks. Because what you're seeing is the outer container of a tradition. If a tradition is like a nuclear reactor, right? You're not going to see, you know, like the dancing naked dakinis from the outside, mm. right? You're not going to realize that the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, when he's doing his Kala Chakra visualizations, is visualizing like this huge, like, sexual orgy happening. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because he's he's generating vast amounts of energy. Uh, yeah. Right. The site generating like, fuck. Yeah, that's right. And then how, because you need fuck to penetrate reality with your, with, you know, how deep is your, does your fuck penetrate into mm-hmm. reality? <laughs> it needs, one thing is to have the insight and the compassion, but it also needs like the full power of, of the dinosaur. Mm-hmm. So from the outside, like with any mystery tradition, you know, just like with, a, with the Hindus, like the, often you'll see like Ganesha. Ganesha was the, um, the symbol of the mysteries. And it was said because if you were like, yeah, look at this funny thing, I'm like, whatever, like elephant God, I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, that's a joke. It's like a way of keeping, you know, it's like s- keeping people out who probably shouldn't be there. Mm. But if you penetrate into the mandala, which is like a, like a nuclear reactor, and you go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, right? The, the depth of, of that nuclear reactor, you find like the full power and potency of, and passion of what it means to be a human being. But of course, that's also what's caused a huge amount of suffering on this planet, right? So it, it is like, in order to be like a fully passionate human being, it actually takes an initiatory journey, yeah. right? Because if you're, fully, if you're a fully passionate adolescent, which I'm sure, you and I have were, were both. Mm-hmm. I mean, I got, <laughs> that's, that's, you know, there was some mess, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there is a, there's a, um, a learning process, right? To be able to harness and, and sublimate those energies. Yeah. And I was fortunate that, you know, my mother and grandmother were so, such loving beings uh-huh. that at least the mother Tantra was, mm-hmm. was clean. Right for me, yes, and that's uh, that actually kept yes. that actually kept me in contact with the morals, the ethics of eros and ethics well, of, you, and your joy, of self, your in, jo- in my your, joy. Yes, that's also right. like all of that was was intact. Now, the father tantra was confusing. It was confusing. It, it was beautiful yes, right. in many ways, but right. it was it was tricky. Yes, <laughs> it was yes. tricky, and so that's the right. so a lot of the work has been, you know, trying to navigate how to like find that in right accord that's right and yeah. and and merge both of those as well and and what you said about symbols i think is also really really valuable uh so again burning man being recent i was given a new playa name and the playa name was perfect as as a good name should be and it was mm-hmm. dragon heart mm-hmm. And it symbolized to me exactly this, mm-hmm. all of the ferocity of the dragon, sure, all of the infinite yeah. ferocity, the teeth, the fire, mm-hmm. the, the scales, the wings, the, mm-hmm. you know, the, think of everything of a dragon, but then heart, like real heart, not That's just right. like the dragon having a beating thing that moves blood. No, like mm-hmm. heart, like real heart, like Christ, like, yeah. like that, that, that level of heart and both. That's Both, right. well, and that symbol to right. me was that's like, right. all right, yes. I fucking, and that's so I right. dressed like Dragonheart, mm-hmm. I acted like Dragonheart, mm-hmm. I lived, and there was nothing that I needed to fight out there, <laughs> so it was just joy, mm-hmm. it was just just rapture, 
Well, because you're in full contact with all of your power, Absolutely. therefore it doesn't leak out into the world at all. Yeah. Right? The, I mean, and it didn't need to prove itself in the shadowy adolescent forms mm -hmm. that, the sh that the adolescent warrior will try to, I'm tough, well, let me show you. Right, let me right, show you my right. dragonness. Let me burn this thing down or fucking, <laughs> or fuck this person up. Like, no, no, I right, know I'm a dragon. Right. I don't need to roar mm -hmm. unless I need to roar. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And so that's the, the power of, the, of good symbols. Mm -hmm. I think as we develop these, these kind of universal understandings, like a symbol practice. Well, this is a deep, you're right. This is a deep structure. I mean, uh, with many of my students, I, I'll help them design their deities, right? So rather, you know. How do you get to be one of your students? This sounds <laughs> awesome. Like, where do you sign up? Oh, well, <laughs> you want the website? <laughs> um, but so, so traditionally, like if you look at the traditional archetypes, there's all these, you know, pantheons, right? So you can think of your pantheon as your, um, you know, your, your, your ice cream flavors. Right. But in traditional culture, because traditional culture um, hadn't yet individuated, the tendency was is you were just like, you were just given a practice. Oh, you're just gonna worship Apollo. You're just gonna green Tara. Because, because the ego structures of a thousand, two thousand years ago weren't very sophisticated, a lot mm. of them. But now, I mean, God, like we want our own color, like iPhone and like everything has to be, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the, de the, the, the archetypal, the archetypal yoga, which is what you're talking about, which is what are the various archetypes that you're needing to bring forth and how do you integrate those, right? That I believe needs to be individuated mm. because now um, the individuation process is not something that the traditions were strong with. Mm -hmm. The individuation process is really one of the Western gifts, right? Which is like, how do I individuate from being fused into the cultural norm? But to individuate, you have to kind of recognize like what are the archetypes that are, that, that are kind of your unique configuration of archetypes because there's some that you just, that you and I just don't have, right? right? I mean, we all have a, we're, there's a mixture, but you can look across the, the room and say that person, like look at that genius, that's amazing. Like math, mathematical intelligence or culinary intelligence or, you know, Kinesthetic, kinesthetic, and these are these are different lines. Sure. So both of us, we're we're all a combination of these archetypal energies. I mean, this is what astrology, esoteric astrology, was all about, which was basically. I mean, it's funny, right? The the research on holotropic breath work, the one thing that they found, like Groff and and Tarnas and these guys found, that was that would indicate what kind of psychedelic experience somebody was gonna have in a holodropic breathwork in a psychedelic thing was their birth chart, <laughs> right? I mean, because basically, according to the ancients, this is the configuration of the archetypes. Mm -hmm. So then if we can then from that, get a sense of the symbol, like what is like the symbol, the soul symbol that wants to give birth to itself, right? And if you're meditating on that as part of your meditation practice. So for instance, in a traditional meditation practice, you would begin by like dissolving everything into the fundamental unified field, calming the mind, dissolving into the unified field, and then arising from within that field as Dragonheart, mm -hmm. right? But Dragonheart isn't just a, is not just a self, he's a world as well. Yeah. Because the way that the human self-structure is built is we are self-world constructs meaning Aubrey is both Aubrey and Aubrey's world. The, e the ego structure, the self-structure is a world, is a self-world structure. Yeah, fractalization of the universe Does that itself. make sense? In like, a way, yeah. Yeah, so not only is there, not only is there dragon heart, but there's also the, what's called the mandala of dragon heart, meaning there's a world that dragon heart lives in, mm -hmm. right? Now this is the magic because if, the world of that archetype is it is Eden, right? It, it is this coming civilization that we're giving birth to. Mm -hmm. To the extent that when you sit in full potency as Dragonheart, right, and you see and you feel the world as that, we're beginning to draw that into existence. And that's what fueled all the synchronicity that you're experiencing. It wasn't just the psychedelics. 
it was like the identification with your central archetype. Right. Right, which was the archetype of self and world. Because if we could help you push dragon, I mean, if we could have dragon half a president, mm. right? If we could push, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. If, if you went all the way. There'd be a lot of tables turning over. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be a lot, right? a lot of tables that's turning right. over. Yeah, yeah, that's right, so yeah. That, so that was the function of deity yoga, of archetypal yoga, is like if you fuse yourself to dragon heart, and we would refine it more, the world cannot not transform. Yeah, this was, a, this was the idea, the alchemical idea behind we threw a, a donation-based music festival, which to my knowledge has never been done. It's a horrible financial idea for anybody who wants any <laughs> ideas. We lost our ass financially, but it was a magical experience because everybody came and they just gave what they felt, you know, felt in their heart to give. And it, it cultivated, and the idea was that we were gonna anchor in an, a future world, a, new, a world that is, you know, yet to come. Yeah. And and we called it Arcadia. And Arcadia, Arcadia. has some references to mm -hmm. that type of world sure. in, in antiquity as well. And and the idea was that if we actually abide magically and, and make this not just the name of a music festival, but we abide by new principles yes. that have that are true in mm -hmm. this world, we'll actually draw the default world towards Arcadia. That's right. And as sixteen hundred people it was one of the most magical experiences I've encountered That's because right. that many people all ascribing to this idea of Arcadia. And I think Burning Man does that in its own way as well. But it drew it drew that reality. We could just feel it kind of drawing that reality right. a little bit closer. Right, right, right. So what I'm, in, what I'm interested in doing in my work is building an initiatory structure where we get to do that and then we get to empower that over sustained amount of time with the world's most powerful contemplative practices. Right. Right. So what happens when you create when you create that but then you have like a sole commitment to your brothers and sisters in the room that you that you're going to maintain that and then that's charged up with continued practice like with practice. Yeah. That you know that's the um in the Indo-Tibetan tradition we talk about building a mandala. A mandala is like a, a time machine. It's it's a coherent structure that is both that is organizational, but it's also subtle energy, right? And and it, meaning it is it's, it's it's built from the inside of reality out. And that mandala has grades of initiation that you move through as you're moving through. You're getting kind of form, formatted into the ethos of that new culture. And at each level, for instance, you'd have certain ethical, behavioral, meditational components. That's how these initiatory systems were built. You know, we have to, we have to architect and build an initiatory system to bring hundreds of thousands of people through. That, that combines- uh, You working on it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm sitting here with you, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we, the, the, deep structure, the deep structure we have worked out it's it's now like, it's like the plug and play pieces, right? We have to fit in um, the psychedelic um, line has to be woven through, right? Yeah, that thread, right? The relational line has to be woven through, but essentially the deep structure of what that of what that process looks like has been worked through all the way to Rainbow Body. And what I mean by that is like Rainbow Body Tech is like, well, if we would, so that process of Arcadia. Mm -hmm. Um, Shakyamuni Buddha did a similar thing with a, with, a, with a king in a kingdom called Shambhala. And the king was like, hey, you know, I, I've heard about this meditation thing, but you know what? I've got five wives. I'm not, I'm not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what are we gonna, what are we gonna do about, about this way of living? So the Buddha taught the Kala Chakra Tantra, the Wheel of Time Tantra. So the Wheel of Time was basically like, how do you synchronize a whole culture? So you first synchronize in time, right? Then you synchronize like, so that synchronization got, went all the way to the whole, the whole kingdom went rainbow body. And rainbow body tech is like, is like Jesus, right? The, the dematerialization of the, that whole thing. That technology in the Indo-Tibetan tradition is well established. Well, it seems like there are some steps missed. Synchronizing in time seems like you could all be listening to the same music or right, something okay, like that. Okay, so yeah, so what is that? So 
there's this, the synchronization process happens first culturally. So part of the problem that we have is that we are playing the time signature of empire. Mm -hmm. They're defined, the calendar that we're operating in right now is the, 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 the rhythm that maintains the discordance. Mm -hmm. Like September, October, September means seven. Why is it the ninth month? Why is oct means eight? Why is it the, the whole thing has been calibrated for a particular time. If you control time, you control everybody because they're all happening inside of your time, <laughs> right? So color chakra is about transformation of a time. Like how do, you, how do we literally go from one age to another age, right? Like That's the question because we got to do it. Right? We got to do it, right? So a color, so building a color chakra, building a time wheel is like building an initiatory system that facilitates the transformation from one time to another. The outer aspect has just got to do with timing, right? So like w w the timing of practices, well, you start with the month, right? Full moon and new moon, right? Because that begins to, to, to synchronize you with not only, the not only the natural planet, but the planetary hierarchy. Because the planetary lineages, the planetary hierarchy ran on sacred time. Yeah. If you want to get a synchronization of those agents who are in matter and those agents are still in the subtle, you need, you need to get a, a temporal synchronization. Otherwise, it's, you know, you're, not getting, you're not getting the information isn't coming from headquarters. That's why all the big you know, megaliths of the past were organized towards you know, That's right. equinoxes exactly. and, and into exactly. all of the difference, both solar and lunar exactly. you know, kind of patterns that existed. And those are real patterns within our bodies. Yeah. And within, so when we start synchronizing in that way, the group mind starts to syn synchronize, right? So that's a great way to get people organized into, into time that's not in the time of empire. That's, that's right, we, need, that's we, we literally need to, you know, to have a new time and to have enough people to say, okay, we'll start, at least start with, with this configuration of time. Did, uh, did Garcom the Druid, did he, he's gotta be all about that, right? <laughs> well, the Druids, for sure, they, yeah, they have, that, they have their sacred calendar. I mean, we, because when you're on a sacred calendar, you're defining what the fucking time is. <laughs> Whose time is it? Is it Caesar's time? I mean, we're on the Julian, like what's the, the Gregorian, Gregorian calendar, right? Time is money. Uh -huh. Like we all feel that. You cannot not feel that as long as you're on that calendar. Yeah. Right? So that's, that would be like the outer dimensions of a color chakra is, is just the synchronization. And of course, the idea of color chakra is, is as that becomes more sophisticated, the mechanisms of culture become synchronized with the movements of the planets. So the, if, if, so it, And then the holidays, which used to be synchronized with different uh -huh. harvests and different actually archetypal energies have been hallmarked into fucking nonsense. That's right. All the initiatory practices sure. that of all the coming of ages and the bar right. mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs right. of all cultures and all, they're all nonsense. <laughs> marriage, that's, marriage, that's right. death, birth has all been right, sterilized. Right. You're into, right. Yeah. So much needs to be because those are all things that happen in time. Yeah. So the view of the of color chakra, which is similar to the view of of the great Kabbalists, is that the whole of this, well, the whole of the cosmos is alive, but the solar system is an organism, and and the planets are various organs moving <laughs> through fields. When you synchronize a culture with with what's happening it starts to awaken by itself to itself. That actually, you know how I said that we're already, it's already open, it's already synchronized. The issue is that we're just completely desynchronized with, with heaven. Is part of this process that science as a almost reli you know, religious For sure. force has then gone about trying to scientifically debunk all of the subtle energies and synchronizations with all of these different things as well. Like everything that would be parapsychology, paranormality, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, f everything from fucking acupuncture to sure. astrology, right. you know, science with its rigorous, you know, fucking sword has been like, this is bullshit, this is bullshit, this is bullshit. And through the scientific method, when you actually follow it in its own game, it will actually prove out you know, all a lot of those, of those things. things. If you look at the research, all of those things are proven. 
Yeah. I mean, like, have you, have you ever checked out with the University of Virginia's Department of Perceptual Studies? No. They've been studying reincarnation there for 50 years. Like, this is, a, this is like an American university. They have, like, thousands of case studies of, like, of it. I mean, I would say, like, if you look into the research on reincarnation done in an American university by top, like, parapsychologist scientists, like, the, the, the evidence is phenomenal. And, and that's, so, that's just and so it's just it's just the capture of science by agenda. I mean, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to actually shit on well, science. No, no, I think no, science no, is very I know important. You, I know exactly what you said. What you I mean, so empire, empire has controlled science. Right. Right. I and, mean, and cherry picked and utilized it and funded whatever. Again, it needed if, to, if you tell if you tell people what's true and what's not true, you tell them what's sacred and what's not sacred. Like by con by controlling the narrative, right? You cut out the sacred. And when you cut out the sacred, you cut out people's access to, to real power. Yeah. I mean, this is where the collusion between, you know, the forces of, of, of the church and the banks and of tech, there's a, you know, whether it's, a, whether it's consci conscious or unconscious, so to speak, but the collusion that keeps that new paradigm from really, you know, being born, um, I mean, well, actually, I, I think it's it's really the onus is on us, and this actually goes back to the Father Tantra piece, because the Father Tantra piece is like, listen, we do have to get organized, mm -hmm. right? Like, you do have to build a Dharma army, and 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 then you do have to deal with sacred hierarchy. We're going to have to deal with that because they're like. Like otherwise, you can't build an organization. If we, if ten years from now, fifteen years from now, we're still sitting around the circle and everyone's having enough time to share their truth, and we think that that's is is what's going to like take care of empire, right? You know, um, yeah. My, my, Elon Musk can't spend five hours a day in processing no, 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 for, no, no, for his right. employees. Well, that's right, um, and he just can't. I was thinking of my my grandmother um, was a. Um, much like you, it was a lot of the the women in my family who uh, kind of held the door open for the the sacred for me. And my grandmother was a um, a Dutch baroness and uh, skied the Olympics, like the thirty eight Olympics downhill skiing. Gangster, yeah. And um, she, so she married a Jew, she married a Jew. Um, my grandfather was a, was Jewish, and uh, so of course they're all in hiding um, in the because she was mm -hmm. she was an aristocrat, he was Jewish, and um, and of course the the Gestapo came and got some of the family. And my grandmother had to march down to I think it was actually the SS to SS headquarters with a and demanded to speak to like the head of the fucking SS there, and like told this guy that he had to like take these people off off the trains. I, was, I mean, she she had this kind of like. I'm an aristocrat, but but the point is, was like when the tanks roll in, right? Like this is the father tantra. Yeah. When the tanks roll in, because if the tanks are rolling in on the other side of the world, it's one world, brother, right? Yeah. And so if the tanks are rolling in, they're rolling in. They're rolling in here right now. Yeah. And so is our is our spirit is Dragonheart strong enough? Like, are we strong enough to be to be in the resistance, right? My one of my other relatives was the she was the the leader of um, the uh, the resistance in Paris. Um, she also died in the concentration camp, and um, her saying was like, "This is not time to to stay in bed, mm. right? Like we, we got to, particularly those of us who have the capacity to, we got to yeah. get we've got to get organized, and we've got to work out how we're gonna like how do we." How are we going to build an organization? How do we heal from the the trauma of hierarchy and patriarchy? But how do we also liberate the sacred masculine so he can be in, of service to the mother? Yeah, right. Because if we want to like that beautiful village that our hearts like feel and see, it needs to be protected, but it also needs to be manifested. Right. That that there's a there's a role for the masculine. There's a role for like what you've done building your business. Yeah. I mean, that takes, that, 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 you know, that takes some, that there's a dimension of the sacred there. For sure. Right. It feels to me very much like in this period, what I'm doing 
and I think at first it was subconscious and now it's a lot more conscious is I'm building a network. I see that. I'm building a network of, of people and building like true bonds mm. and alliances amongst yeah. that network. And now we're supporting each other and we're all kind of doing our own individual thing. But there's this sense that there's going to be a time mm. where you just say now. No. That's right. Like now. That's right. Now. Yeah. And it's now and this yeah. is this is it. The proverbial tanks, whatever they are, they're rolling. And now we stand and we stand together. And, That's right. And it's like, I don't know when that time is coming and some part of me prays that it won't, but some part of me knows it, it most likely will. And uh, and that's, and also just knowing like, it's what I'm, what I'm here for. That's why you came here, brother. That's right. You know, yeah. that's like, yeah, that's it. And when I see that depicted in, and I think about, I can't think about it without getting emotional, you know, because I can get lost in my own <laughs> trivialities of difficulty in my own, <laughs> psychodramas and bullshit yeah. you know yeah. you're on psychodrama yeah, yeah of course sure and then i remember and i have a moment like this where i like i remember yeah like i remember what i'm really here for and like what i'm built for and what i what i chose to come here for and what i'm and then it it, it recalibrates everything and the whole world looks a little different after that oh, and, right. and i and that's it's right. like i'm home i'm home again right right, right. And and the tears wash away the old frames mm -hmm. of of this little trouble and this little concern and this oh fucking crypto's down. I was stupid of me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, painful. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. You know, so it's uh it's yeah, it's uh, and I see that in a movie too. Like I watch you watch three hundred, you watch Braveheart, and they and they just said no. You know, at some point that masculine principle just said no. That's right. That's right. You know, that's like you, you mentioned our relate your relationship with death, our relationship with death. I mean, the path the path of of war of spiritual sacred warriorhood has got a lot to do with about resolving that relation, like being okay with that, and also having a narrative, a story that's already like it's already gone through, mm -hmm. right? And this is where the context is so important, like really having an appreciation the reincarnation is a real thing yeah and even and even if you don't like then at least run it as an app long enough to see how does it actually change your consciousness right like beliefs are also are psychoactive you know part of tantra is recognizing that if we're going to have beliefs which humans do well let's build the most beautiful fucking belief system that's th that's like a fucking bulldozer and and, and is not going to be intimidated Right, and even if that is not true, it doesn't matter because if it gets the job done. Mm -hmm. Now, you know uh, uh, the perennial traditions, the, the great sages of every tradition would say, and it is true, mm -hmm. right? But resolving that that issue around death, making death our friend. There's one practice in the in the Tibetan um, Buddhist tradition called like making death as your consort. Mm. Right, so this dragon, so Dragonheart, so this Yamantaka figure, Dragonheart, Death Destroyer. So imagine him as like this, like he's a mm -hmm. in the traditional iconography, he's like a fire breathing Minotaur, mm -hmm. right? And then so, so there's one level is the Minotaur, which you could think of as dinosaur. That's the reptilian brain, mm -hmm. and then on top there's another head, which is the the limbic brain, and then on top there's another head, which is like the cortex, right? As the three. So he's embracing, he's like full of fucking wrathful compassion. And actually he's the deity, the practice that all of the, the scholar monks do in Tibet. So these little scholars, when they're going into their room, they're visualizing themselves to being these like minotaurs on heat. So anyway, wow. Yamantaka death destroyer, and he's holding in sexual embrace death. <laughs> right right like he's fucking death <laughs> right that 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 that's the diamond mind that can then can that that degree of energy is the energy necessary like builds up so that that diamond mind can cut through and make that metaphor a reality yeah
Do you know what I mean? And it's and death is not just the literal biological death it's the death of any identity structure you have it's a death of any you have to be willing to move through all of that and if that means getting canceled on social media or if that means whatever you know deep fear that we have now in a world where pitchforks come as pixels and comments on a fucking twitter post or something like that right but the fear of the mob and the fear of the death of reputation or the death of that it's it's fucking that too well yeah i mean i think yeshua i think that his walk to that cross i think a big piece of it was that was the shame and humiliation right the when when i've looked i don't know about you but when i look at my psyche and the place where it jams up is like is shame like Mm -hmm. like like that place where like we have just extreme shame or extreme humiliation which is like the most painful relational right you mentioned that we would like that we project to defend ourselves but i think like at at the what we would be defending ourselves against relationally at some level is like being humiliated and shamed of course right to know yourself as to know yourself as dragon heart but to be dragged through the street you know helpless and impotent you know and the humiliation of that but but i think he says so what he says is he says yes to that yeah. So the archetype so of the he fucks it. And he fucks it and destroys right? it. And so the vic- so the archetype of the victim becomes the archetype of the willing sacrifice. Right. Right. And it you know in in the Narnia books, do you remember? The, did you ever read the Narnia books? The Lion, the Witch, bit. and the Wardrobe. Yeah. Well, they well, they they were like sacrificing Aslan, the lion, which is the Christ figure on this big slab. And he's like, well, what they don't realize is the deepest form of magic is the sacrifice for love. Uh-huh. Right, the deepest form of magic is dragon heart. It's yeah. like just pour it all into the heart, right? And so that, to the extent that we can get over the humiliation we have from our Twitter feeds, <laughs> <laughs> which is, right. I, I have to admit, I've never faced that humiliation. I haven't faced that right. yet. Right. But to the degree that you can be exposed to that, and like turn it the other way, right? That's the the the, the tantric. The, the tantric move is to say yes, mm-hmm. right? The, in alchemy, so tantra is, is alchemy, right? And in alchemy, it's understood that the anima mundi, that, your, that our soul isn't just this, what's arising here, it's also what's coming from, from the world, right? That it's, if it's non-dual, then everything out there is also your soul. Yeah. And of course, if soul is, is, is here for its own joy, it's a very Kabbalistic kind of way. Like, yeah. If it's here for its own joy, then whatever's coming from the anima mundi, from the soul of the world, is, is here in the service of, of awakening soul. Mm. So that's what, you know, Jesus as a magician, what he did was knowing that, he said yes, yeah. right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say an ecstatic yes to whatever's coming at us no matter no matter how difficult it is because i don't know about you but so much of the pain is when i think that this shouldn't be happening yeah of right? course right but if of it's course. like oh even this even this pain that i'm experiencing right now is part of the journey when you're like throwing up you know you've taken your ayahuasca <laughs> and you're throwing up I'm, yeah. right i'm sure you're your maestro has has like mm-hmm. coached you how to relate to the no, to the place where you where you where the no becomes a yes. Yeah, and it's interesting. It's like <laughs> William James said. I think, and I don't know if I quote him exactly, but he basically said, "I don't know if free will exists or not, but it's my life is better if I believe that it is that it's true." Yes, and like so, and it goes back to what you're saying about belief. Having this belief that whatever is happening is happening for me. Mm -hmm. That, whether that's, quote, true or not true, your belief in it actually makes it true alchemically. That's right. Because then your response, your response after, like it it almost like you're time traveling to Mm -hmm. your response actually Mm -hmm. changes the past. And you can actually do that and time travel back. And I think that's a lot what of the psychedelic medicine healing, especially MDMA assisted psychotherapy does it. You time travel back to an experience, 
recodify it with a different emotion, understand that it was for you mm. in a way and has created who you are now. And yeah. then you find That's right. ultimately through the rage and through the grief and all the things unfelt, you find gratitude for that and say, right. oh, that was for me for right. this. Right. Whether, right. It in, whether it was or wasn't is actually inconsequential because it was because you said it was. That's right. And yeah. that's magic. That's magic. That's right. And on, and, on, and on a cultural, so we have to be able to do that on a cultural level. I mean, that's what even the, the, the building of mandalas such as yeah. this is to facilitate. That's the, the architecture. Like, well, how do you create the architecture that allows focused, coherent gr groups to dream, to dream together, right? That's when, when we can do that. That's when, well, the world that we see today is the, dream, is the dreaming of certain people in power. Yeah. Right? It's, and it's a shared, and it continues to be shared by the images and the metaphors that are like that are in the media, right? Like that, yeah. that they, they are focusing the psyches of people to focus on, on certain things and to manifest those. Yeah. You know, what, what Dharma Army needs to do is it needs to say, okay, well, let's, let's, let's do the opposite. What kind of projects do we need to do? And what kind of stories do we need to, do we need to write and create? And what new myths That's do right. we need to have? Because I think people severely underestimate the influence of myth. Absolutely. And, and we also think of myths like they happen in the past. No, no, no. No. Star Wars, Game of Thrones, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, Lord of the Rings. Like all of these things are, are mythologies that we have in place that some of it can be helpful and some of it actually is pointing to something that was an old conquesting way of empire that's actually subtly infused in this and in different myths that we have the myth of right, redemptive right. violence is something mm -hmm. my friend charles mm -hmm. eisenstein talks mm -hmm. about a lot right yeah like you just here's bad you get powered up you fucking crush that <laughs> and that's the way it goes well then right. what happens then the bad powers up and crush. so that myth hasn't been sufficiently retold in enough grand ways right. that it actually people start to go like oh yeah this isn't going to work we're not playing Hatfields and McCoys right. with the good and the bad over and over but right now empire in all mm -hmm. of its forms mm -hmm. whether as you said whether conscious or unconscious are using and hijacking and even the algorithms themselves the the magical tools of that they're hijacking right. rage versus That's rage right. side right. versus side polarity versus polarity That's right. So there's all of these kind of ways in which this new story isn't being able to develop and also emphasizing victim consciousness mm -hmm. versus the alchemical consciousness That's of right. this was horrid mm -hmm. and it happened for us. Now let us figure out why and make the why happen and time travel back in time That's right. to whatever the fucking tra tragedy was. Mm -hmm. Why are we grateful for it? Right, right. And that changes that reality right. and, and actually gives us our power back instead of just trying to find as many things you can pile onto the victim pile so mm. that you're the winner of the victim game. <laughs> right, right. That doesn't fucking work. You're no, just no. the most disempowered yeah. that you can possibly be. And of course, Empire's like, go for it. Yeah, yeah. The most disempowered you can possibly <laughs> be. <laughs> Excellent. Mm -hmm. Carry on. That's right. Yeah. The story, I mean, mythology, I, I, think, I, I think what's different about the time that we're in is that what, you know, what, when, we, when we say mythology, Right, we're also thinking of mythic, mythic consciousness. So mythic consciousness is basically a uh, rule role mind, which is very literal and concrete, right? But because that's how we imagine most people believed, they believed those stories, right? Because that was the story. Those stories were told at the level that, that pe most people were at. The, the mythology that's gonna get born in, in our time is gonna, is, is gonna be different because it's gonna be real mm. and what i mean by that is is most people's consciousness is now fact-based right so the mythology is not going to be a mythology it's going to be a revelation it's going to be an apocalypse an apocalypse in the sense of an of a of a, of a revealing mm -hmm. of of what was what was true you know whether it's um historically like the you know the the the, the larger cycles of the color chakra going all the way back to atlantis like not understanding our Understanding our our deep history as perhaps as more as fact, not just a story, but as that there's something that things that happened that that we just didn't know, um, and that includes everything, including extraterrestrials. Like that is not like we're now mm. moving like mythology. Yeah, but what happens when that mythology like 
lands, mm. right? Then what happens is rather than mythology, you're getting a literal sacred world, right? Mm. Where, the, where the story is now not just metaphor, it's actually, yes, this is how it fucking is. <laughs> Helios, the sun, is a, a god. Yeah, it's a yeah, being. It's a fucking being, right? It and, isn't just and, and a and metaphor. Don't take, don't take my fucking word for it. Do enough medicine and look at yeah, it. Yeah, it's <laughs> that's right. It yeah. is just a metaphor. Yeah. Right? So that, you know, in terms of a fourth turning and in terms of a planetary dharma, it's the, that's the tantra, that's the context, which is like real sacred world, right? And we have would, all the pieces for that. What would be, what's, what's interesting to me, and it's interesting that you mentioned this, because what's interesting to me is I've been playing with creating my own mythological world, mm -hmm. but the rule for my mythological world is I have to believe that it's true, actually. Yes, that's it. So that's what but makes it's it a going tantra. to appear. It's going to appear sure. mythological. Sure. So I'm going to place it as like an adjacent mm -hmm. world, like yes. a, a different node in the multiverse. Sure. On the surface level, but actually everything that is happening in there, the magic is real. The that's everything right. is real. The star beings, sure. as far as I know, and of course sure. I don't know perfectly yet whether they're real or not. I've had communications, mm -hmm. et cetera, whatever. But is plausibly real if not actually real in the and so and the magic that can happen in a, an ayahuasca ceremony and what the the ayahuasqueros and the curanderos curanderos their battles and all the things that mm -hmm. are kind of sure. true sure now but but people don't think of them as true in our world and and build a world that is like you said a true a true world mm -hmm. but it's going to appear like myth but we're going to bring people into this world in a way that's like and then that will actually open their eyes to like, wait a minute. Well, when and when we do that, that will build up a morphogenic field. Yeah. So, for instance, you know, one of the technologies involved with um, with with the rainbow body is the ability to once the once the kundalini is really like going on full flame, is then switching to pranic pranic nourishment, right? The ability to just you know, absorb nourishment straight through the field. Because if, if you understand the level of mind that like field or piece of bread is the same thing, then once you're, level, once you're locked in at that level, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty good. You're able to extract energy from the field around you. And the, the value of this is more of an alchemical practice. Like this isn't something you're gonna do in the village. This is more like maybe the end of your life, it's time to leave. Maybe you wanna leave in a trailing, a trailing cloud, you know, blaze of like, boof. So anyway, the, the, the fasting practice, which, which I, mean, I, I mean, I've done it myself for like 20 days water fasting, and I mean, I'm sure you've experimented with these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But up in Tibet, you know, they'll, they'll just roam around up on those, you know, like, like Vim Hof, but without even eating any food. Yeah. Now part of that is because once the mind is that adamant, right, that it's, it's conquered death, like it's seen through, it, that changes chemistry. Mm -hmm. It change, like there's a relationship between now the problem is though is when you come down off the mountaintop and you come into the village if everybody else has mm -hmm. got a field and they're like i don't think i believe in that shit so if you look at the research of people who try to do that in in laboratory environments they with can't people who don't believe it exactly they can't do it yeah I've right had, i've had this discussion with matthias de stefano who remembers uh -huh. a, a past life that he has remembers many of his past lives all of them but remembers one in particular in Kem, which was mm -hmm. a post-Atlantean civilization. Yeah, in Egypt. Yeah. yeah, and he was part of the kind of the water, I don't know if he called it clan or whatever, but mm -hmm. they had different elements who were magicians. Yes. And the water clan was, they were responsible for actually cutting the stones with mm -hmm. water. So they would actually, you know, push, put their identity into the consciousness of the water and they would run a line of water across the stones and they would break the stones mm with the water as water carves the canyons and whatever. And there right. was other people from different, you know, the, I think it was the air, air clan who could sing the stones into a vibrational state where they were light so they could be easily moved yeah. and placed. So with these great mysteries, how did we get these 20,000? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, it could have been 100,000 people with pulleys and ropes and levers, or <laughs> there could have been another technology. That's but then right. I asked him, I'm like, well, can this return? He's like, no, because the morphogenic, the field of belief, mm -hmm prevents that from actually happening in our world because we've actually created a belief system that prevents right. this type of magic from existing in this I time. Mean, but at that time, yeah. everybody believed it. So, and they had the, techno the spiritual technology yeah. as well as the field right. to actually create it. My sense is, is that it, 
once like once science is no longer co-opted by empire and that we begin to apply um research in these dimensions i don't see why those those capacities are, are you know I, I think that they're ahead of us. I mean, I don't know in our lifetime. Well, I, it's just, you, we'd have to start studying things in a different, we'd have absolutely. to start making little breaches. Yes. Little belief, belief breaches. Belief breaches, that's, that's right. And we just need a couple, and then momentum sure. will start to go, oh, oh, oh that's you, right. you can do this? That's oh, right. Oh, well, if that's you can right. do this, can you do this? And then more and more people believe, and more and more people believe. Mm. And... And I think that can change the that can change the dynamic. It's quite possible and plausible, and Matthias kind of talks about this as well, that these extraterrestrial beings mm -hmm. are mostly, and there are some third dimensional type of mm -hmm. type of beings with crafts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, but mo a lot of them are extra dimensional beings, sure as well. And so when we are able to actually tune in, so like, when are the aliens going to come? I don't know. When we're tapping into the multidimensionality of our existence right. and can actually fucking see them. That's right. Because <laughs> they're all they're that's always right. all around. So that's so so one of the reasons for for building a, a contemporary initiatory system that is that is more than a weekend. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is that in order to build these capacities, we like you you want to create a you want to create communities that have gone on a journey together for a significant amount of time have le have like sh like shared certain um educational processes that's what builds that morphogenic field back up right if you think of, if you look at a mandala mandala usually has like an inner core and an outer core part of build it, like Lowering that back down into this realm is you've got to create an initiatory system that if you're hanging with your brothers and sisters who've gone through the same five year journey that you have, mm -hmm. then like there's certain things you can talk about, right? That, that it's just, it, you don't have to cover a bunch of ground first. Yeah. And then what happens when you've been doing that journey for, for 20 or 30 years? That, I think that's when the magic like it's going to happen, and, just, and I've and I've I've been a participant in some very tr trivial forms of this, right. where like harnessing the magic of belief. Mm -hmm. I remember, and it's always been in in somewhat trivial ways that I've enacted this. Mm -hmm. So I brought a bunch of people out to our boat, and we were going to all go surfing. We're all excited. Mm -hmm. The boat wouldn't start. We try everything. Call the mechanics. Call everybody. 45 minutes trying it. We cannot get the engine to turn over whatsoever. And it's a push button thing. It's not right. like I'm fucking pulling a, you know, lawnmower right, or right, something right, like that. Right. And then I just have everybody and I just get in this, I just, something came over me and I was like, everybody, right now, we hear the engine <laughs> roaring. We smell the gas mm -hmm, and we mm -hmm. see ourselves on this water. And, and, and I was just leading this whole thing. And then I was like, right now, when I press this button, this boat will turn on and we're going to like at this moment. Right, right, right. And I had enough <laughs> kind of tekufot, I guess, that that's people right. actually were like, all right, boom. So what if, that's, what if that's 10,000 people? What if it's right. a, a 100,000 people? Right. So and what is, what is, what is possible, you know, and that's, and that starts to, that starts to deeply undermine some of these tenets mm -hmm. of empire. It starts to flip over some core tables that need to be flipped for a new right. system to come in place yeah and we're i mean we're we're such a lucky time i mean we're, we're born in an incredibly lucky time because like all these pieces are here yeah whether it's like whether it's like the ability to to build a um you know the, the use of cryptocurrency to essentially build a, a, a you know to, to fund a new nation right like right. whether you know whether it's the the, the meditative technology, whether it's the the medicine, whether it's the relational technology, whether it's circling or authentic relating, like we have all of these pieces are on the table now. Mm -hmm. It's more about um, architecture, mm -hmm. right? Like um, I, I I look at this as an as an architectural problem, right? We, we no longer appreciate architecture, and what we're talking about here is onto, ontological architecture. Like mm -hmm. how do we create and I'm, I'm sure w with your Sedona experience, for instance, you constructed and architected a particular kind of journey that people were going to be going through. Sure. Right? And, and so we have to learn to do that for much longer periods of time. Yeah. 
right? Um, and, and that, much longer, you know, goals, much, much yes, longer. Yes, that's right. You know, that's not right. like not like the short term. That's right. But but a much bigger. Yeah, and and sh- and and with individual and shared, because I think what happens is as we begin to, which is what's happening, we're all beginning to sh- we begin to share our goals or recognizing that we sh- that we that we have very similar goals. And as people, you, you, as their goals become unified, particularly when it's motivated by the um, by, by the bodhisattva code, by the warrior code for something larger, I mean something um, something beautiful and and good and true is going to unfold. I believe that. I believe that, and I think the the opportunity to start shifting everything radically. Like I have a deep yearning to transcend the idea of completely individual wealth. Now, this doesn't mean just give it all away to everybody Mm -hmm. random, but to get a core group of people together and say, it's no longer mine. Mm -hmm. It's not my house, Mm -hmm. my money, my car, it's ours. That's right. And it's no longer my kid, it's our kid. And it's no longer, it's like, (laughs) Like this, this very, very simple mm-hmm. change is is revolutionary. So the way that the way that we would do this, because I've had the same the same ideal, is that's what you that's what the mandala facilitates. Uh-huh. If you know that people have gone through an initiatory process, right. that is ethical, that is motivational, that is affect, that is that you know by a certain stage that that you, they've gone through something that you've gone through, then you know that then that that, that we can commit. Yeah, because we we both right. So it, it does need that initiatory process, and I've started to I've started to build that too in my own way, and uh-huh. I'll share that. And I've shared it maybe a few times, but so I came up with this idea to create this inner circle of people, mm-hmm. and it's commemorated and symbolized by an exchange of beads. So everybody has their own set of beads. Mm-hmm. So you have your bead that represents you. Mm-hmm. And then That's great. when you that. find somebody else who's in then everybody else, they, they have their beads. And when you reach that state of just radical trust, like you and me, we're in this together. What's mine is yours. What's yours is mine. We're to the very end. Mm-hmm. You know, you actually go through a ceremony or a ritual that actually brings out anything that, anything that might be there, both circling and conversation and also some kind of initiatory experience where you really learn like, all right, what's it like? Because I remember with my, you know, one of my best friends, Kyle, we did an aboga journey together, just me and him mm. in a room. You know, we had people up all night ready to, ready to, you know, go in it, but it was just me and him and we're in this journey. Mm. And it was like, aboga is a deeply challenging medicine. But it was like, at the end of this, if there's anything inside us or anything inside you that's not there, we'll pause on the ceremonial exchange. And the ceremonial exchange includes vows and the vows are exchanged and the beads are exchanged. That's... And so, and then I saw, I've seen myself at my death with a, with a necklace of all of these beads and it was my most precious thing. It was the thing that as I was passing, it was like, I had this and this that, was I the, mean, that's, that's real wealth. That was it. Right? That, of all that the is, things, that of is, all the that things is, in my life, that was right. the thing that mattered the most. That's right. Oh man. <sighs> well, and, and to be able to build that so it can be decentralized. So that, so that, exactly. right? That, that, that once we have the, the new bodhisattva codes, once we have the new Torda codes, I mean, essentially they can be decentralized and shared. So, so. And, that's, and that's the whole idea that's is right. that everybody has their own strand. And that's so right. I think one of the problems with communities is there's been like, all right, this is our community, mm-hmm. put a velvet rope around it. There's the outside, there's the inside. So the outside attacks the inside because they secretly probably want to be on the inside. Mm-hmm. And then there's also people on the inside mm-hmm. Which you're like, well, I don't really fucking trust that guy. Like a fraternity, for example. I was Kappa Sigma. No. <laughs> and you have your brothers and you're right. supposed to like, you're supposed to have this. But I was like, not that fucking guy. <laughs> like, I, you, know, you know what I mean? It's like, right, you right, still right. you still give them yeah. respect and whatever. Yeah. But it's like, you're not, you haven't really forged that with that person in particular. So I wouldn't have traded beads with that person. Mm. And I think the ability to actually have your own strand and then the magic of when, let's say there's three people, so let's say so myself and Vilana and Caitlin and Eric, we've all traded beads mutually. So there's this quadrant mm-hmm. where we're all actually, and, and it's, an open, it's an open loop. Mm-hmm. They can bring anybody else, their cousin that we don't know yet, 
who they've gone through, you know, gone through so many things with from fucking Rhode Island. And we're like, I'd love to meet that person at some point, but I don't know. I'm not, like, I wouldn't trade beads with that person. They don't go, they don't belong on my necklace, right. but maybe someday. Right. And then, but, and it goes, and anybody can start that and anybody can start this and, and just open sourcing That's right. the technology and the, and the practice. So then, and then I saw then also everybody who has their own home bead, you'd create this kind of larger gathering somewhere where everybody's wearing their bead necklace and you're meeting new people who have similar ethos and then new opportunities to trade beads for That's form. beautiful. I, I love that vision. Yeah. I mean, that, I, that's, I mean, that's the, the, I mean, th those are those are the pieces that fit into that architecture, right? That that we need to facilitate those kinds of relationships, and the, um, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, man. Yeah, John, this has been. Uh, I had a feeling. Yeah, <laughs> I had a good feeling from the moment we talked, and uh, and and uh, really was insisting that we do this in person, and uh, and just so grateful for the introduction from you know daniel schmachtenberger yeah. who, who set this up and That's then right. the, the intuition and the and the yes yeah the mutual here. yes right. and and here we are and uh i know it's just the beginning yeah and i kind of casually joked about uh how to become you know a student because it feels like yeah. you should have to climb a mountaintop or do something well, can, particularly can, yeah, arduous yeah, 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 but yeah. you can actually find you on yeah, a fucking you, you website can, you can yeah like you can go to karuna mandala Karuna, K A R U N A, Mandala, M A N D A L A dot org, or Dr. John Churchill dot com. Right. Yeah. 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 So much love, my brother. Absolutely. All yeah. right. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for yeah. tuning in. We love you. Goodbye. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.